What if Deku was a spy? We saw Deku in the original anime when he and Class 1A put on disguises to save Bakugo, and since then, I've had my thoughts about Deku being a spy but never really acted on them. Until now, with the anime of Spy X Family right around the corner, myself and that one weeb saw our opportunity to drop this series like this, and that said, we took it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoy. Hey Ross, sauce it up. It all begins several, several years before the original story of My Hero Academia, with Deku on his way to the Quirk Doctor. You see, in this version of My Hero Academia, when Deku goes with his mother to get his Quirk checked for to see if he has any power, by this point, Deku's already been indoctrinated by All Might's videos into making All Might out as some sort of god-like figure in Deku's mind. And just like the original My Hero Academia, Zuku would be told that he has no quirk. However, that was not the only test that Izuku was forced to take. You see, that day when he had been taken away for testing, it was around 1 to 2 hours. A mere 10 minutes of that actually being a test to see if Deku had a quirk. The rest of it being a test by the Public Safety Commission. For those of you who are unaware of what that is, that is the government underbelly that raised and turned Hawks into the number two hero in the world of My Hero Academia in the actual show and manga. The Public Safety Commission would be looking for very specific children, testing their intelligence and deductive reasoning skills. This is a test that, unlike his quirk test, Deku would have flying colors in. Deku's deductive ability in My Hero Academia has always been above average, even if his combat ability itself was not. Deku himself being a master class level strategist when he has his tools set before him. But I digress. As I mentioned, Deku himself has been crushed. He had just been told that his quirk test was an absolute failure. However, they did find something else, as the doctor pulls forth some x-ray scans of Deku. He'd show that Deku actually has a tumor in his brain that is requiring surgery. Deku's mother being horrified as Inko has no idea what this could mean, asking what, what's going on, as they explain that it's incredibly dangerous and they need to get him into surgery as soon as possible. Of course, as they take Deku behind closed doors, there simply is no tumor, as Deku would be sweeped away by the Public Safety Commission to be indoctrinated and trained in the Children's Division, the same as Hawks was all those years ago. Inko would never see her son again, with her being told that her son had died in surgery being shown an expertly made body double. Inko would be devastated, not knowing how or why her baby boy had died so suddenly, how this could have happened, how, how they hadn't seen any signs, how it just, just happened all of a sudden. Inko would be confused and eventually cast aside as the Public Safety Commission had now collected what they were looking for. From this point on, our perspective will be following that of a young Izuku Midoriya. Uh, where are we going, Doctor? Izuku would ask. The doctor, chuckling, explained to Izuku that they're heading somewhere for very special children. As Deku would try pulling his hand away, saying he wants to see his mom, having been walking for a while now. At this point is where three men in full white suits with black visors covering their eyes would appear as they pick up and grab Deku, Deku now being unable to scream, move, or say anything, as Deku would be forced to be crying out for All Might to save him. No one could hear his cries, no one would be coming to save him, as Deku is dropped into the white room, the location where all of the kids are kept while they're not being forced into testing. Deku would rub his eyes waking up, realizing that he'd been asleep, as he looks down seeing that he's wearing the same clothes as everyone else. It would just be a flat white shirt with gray pants. Deku could even see kids younger and older than him, as he wonders what's going on. It's as Deku's looking around that someone would tap him on the shoulder from behind, as he turns seeing a boy a bit taller and definitely older than him, who would have bright red wings. Deku would be mesmerized, asking what his quirk is, this making the boy take a step back. Huh? <laughs> You're asking about that before my name? Gee, that's weird. 
You don't have that many friends, do you? Deku would look up saying, I, I have plenty of friends like Kachan and uh, the other background characters. Uh-huh, sure thing, kid. Well, I guess I'll introduce myself first then. My name's Keigo. Keigo Takami. T takami It's nice to meet you. I'm... I'm Izuku Midoriya. The blind boy would quickly turn, telling him to be quiet, as he says that he doesn't want other people to hear their names too loudly. As Deku would be wondering why, he turns suddenly as he sees one of those strange, tall men come into the room. Takami would explain to Izuku, saying that our names are worthless here. If they hear you identify yourself with your real name, then they'll... Deku would be shocked as he sees right in front of him exactly as Takami says. The child in front of him would have a burn mark implanted on their skin with a number. As we see a brand being pressed into their arm, the kid screaming, as Deku would cover his mouth. Deku would whisper, How long have you been here? Hawks would smile, saying, <laughs> My whole life. It's here that we now begin to see a friendship develop between Deku and Hawks. Hawks only taking interest in Deku because of one thing. He's never seen only one kid come in at a time. That means just like him, Deku had been screened and had passed the test. Anyway, the real test had already begun, as the children would then be forced to take multiple standardized tests every single day. After these tests would begin training, being forced to do workouts, work with their quirks, or in the case of Izuku and other quirkless, learn how to use weapons. While Hawks would be focusing on learning how to use his wings and his feathers ability, Izuku would be focused on trying to survive in his own way, learning about what type of weapon he could use, trying different things. At first, Deku wanted to use a sword since little kid, swords are cool, but he could barely even pick it up, not even being able to swing it around, as he just holds it before it falls to the ground, clattering on the stone. Whenever they weren't training, Izuku would talk to Takami, Hawks, as I'll be referring to him from this point forth, all about All Might as he tells Hawks everything he ever had watched on the screen of how All Might he's sure is going to come save them, Deku having this light in his eyes. Hawks would simply turn away smiling as he says, you should keep dreaming that, as the testing will continue. After the first year of them being there, Azuka had begun being taught Judo, Taekwondo, Kung Fu, and almost any other hand-to-hand -hand combat that they could throw at him mixing and matching to see which one would be best for him, as Izuku would quickly be getting the handle of hand-to-hand -hand combat with a sparring partner, typically of course that partner being Hawks. This would not last very long, as all of the kids would begin getting called. Each standardized test, whoever had the lowest score, would disappear in the middle of the night, the kids having no idea what's going on. Hawks and Deku though would already know what's happening, the weak are getting called off, they're pulling the cream of the crop now, is what Hawks would be saying, Deku nodding. Hawks, during this entire last year, has been trained intensely, working on how to control his wings with precision, just like he had in the original timeline. Deku, on the other hand, being forced to train in all types of martial arts, and how to use weapons like daggers, throwing knives, hidden firearms like pistols, or sometimes even things like grenades or flashbangs. And eventually, the day had come. Hawks was scheduled to take his final test, as Hawks, after taking his test, would leave and never return. Zuku's older brother, and who would become his best friend, disappearing in a single night. Deku gulped, promising that he'd survive for the both of them, telling Hawks that even though he's gone, he's, he's going to live on for him as Deku would train his deductive ability even harder, mastering parkour as well as hand-to-hand -hand combat throughout the next several years, as we now see Azuku Midoriya at the age of middle school, the same age that Hawks had been when he had disappeared. A majority of the kids Deku had seen in the room at this point had all been switched out and changed, to the point where Deku was now the one next in line. The one next set in line to graduate under the tutorage of the Public Safety Commission. And so, his final testing day would come, Deku one night being taken away as he disappears just like all of the other kids had when he was growing up. Deku would open his eyes, feeling like it was morning, well, never really knowing since he hasn't seen a morning in so long anyway, as he'd be then to explained by a proctor that he would be taking two sections of the exam, a written exam 
and an exam on the field. Huh? Deku be confused, having no idea this is the test? Then did Hawks... Wait, he could be... He could still be alive. Deku and Hawks had always predicted that if the test had been a success, that they would have been returned to the White Room. But what if... What if they let them leave after they pass? Deku would gulp, thinking this... This might be my only chance, as Deku would harden himself to take the test. The written exam would be fairly easy for Deku to accomplish, as he simply has to understand how to do all the principles, math equations, English and grammar, Japanese, other similar topics, as well as some deductive questions, all of which this Deku can easily navigate through with no issue. 100%. And after completing the written exam, which took about one and a half to two hours, Deku would then be instructed to stand from his desk, as suddenly the entire room would turn dark. As the light turns on, Deku's desk would have sunk into the floor as well as his chair, as the entire room would begin moving upwards. Are we in an elevator, Deku would be thinking? With Deku rising out of the elevator as the doors at the top open, Deku stepping out as he sees that he's on top of a building, and it's nighttime. Deku would find in front of him an earpiece and a silencer pistol. Deku would read the instructions inscribed as he places the earpiece in his right ear, listening to see what they have to say. Agent 9, this will be your first on-field test. On the ground we have 30 men, all placed, looking for you. They have no idea where you've come out of, excited that's in here in Kamino Ward. You'll be making your way to the center of the Kamino Ward. After arriving through the city without being captured or seen, or damaged in any way, you must retrieve the object we desire. As we've enclosed in the files before you, you have 07 hours. We'll see you in the morning. Deku would come to realize that his designation as 009 when he was in the White Room was now his agent title, Agent 9. Deku would open the files in front of him and begin reading, as the files explained to him the purpose of his enlistment. His role as the heroes behind the scenes, the people who keep Japan and the world running as a spy. A spy? Deku would be thinking. As Deku would be thinking about what this even means, as suddenly alarms would be blaring all over the ward. Tch, I gotta get going. Deku wouldn't consider it no longer, simply wanting to get out of that room. Deku would grab the silencer pistol as he then runs down the emergency fire escape stairs, leaping off as he leaps from rooftop to rooftop using his terrain and parkour skills that he's gained over the years. Deku would have his silencer pistol, quote unquote, on a stun safety mode filled with tranquilizers, so that he wouldn't accidentally be killing any of the Public Safety Commission's men. Deku would suddenly spot one, moving down the alleyway, looking around, carefully. Deku almost missed him after seeing just the faintest bit of light in his eyes, as he sees that this guy is dressed in all black to hide in the camouflage. Deku is, of course, still wearing the same outfit that is in the white room, which is a white shirt and gray pants. Obviously, Deku would think this is not a great match. Deku would use a tranquilizer, getting a perfect shot, as he then climbs and descends the building, taking and stripping the man of his clothes and switching out, now in a darker, more uniform outfit, as well as matching with his pursuers. The area was blocked off from civilians because of construction, so obviously there wouldn't be any civilians for Deku to worry about, or use to hide. Deku would take advantage of the situation, as he then climbs back to the top of the rooftop, but as he's about to reach for the final brick, Deku could hear footsteps. Deku would drop down to the next level as he breaks into the window, making a loud sound. Immediately, he'd hear a mumbling voice, hearing a radio signal from someone else above him. As Deku then runs through the building, he'd make it to the other side before someone else enters into the room. Deku would immediately turn his arm without even looking back and shoot where the noise is coming from, immediately hearing a slumping sound as whatever had just walked past him was now on the ground unconscious. Two down, 28 left. Immediately as he exits out of the building, now on the ground floor, he would hear someone and sense them coming. Deku would turn, not having time to use his pistol since they're way too close, and would switch to hand-to-hand -hand combat, pistol whipping the guy in the face. As he's about to call out for help, Deku would silence him, choking around him as he wraps his legs around him and squeezes his neck with his hands. Agent 9 squeezing harder and harder, the person whose neck his hands were squeezing, falling unconscious. As Deku would leave him there, now moving forward towards the center of the Kamino ward. Eventually, Deku would arrive at the center tower, where a majority of the people were stationed who were there looking for him. It would be here where Deku comes up with a plan. 
As we watched from the enemy's perspective, suddenly a car would start moving towards them. What the? Where did it even? The car would break into the building, exploding, as all of the people on the ground floor and in the higher floors would turn their attention towards the explosion. As they cleared the car, they'd realize that there's no person inside. It was just clothes stuffed with plastic bags and trash on the side of the road. And while they were all distracted, Deku had already made his way smoothly into the building, now climbing through an air shaft as he had arrived at the center vault of the tower, slowly making his way into the room as he sees a single glove. A glove for your right hand, sitting in the center of the room. The glove having the text engraved on the metal case in which it was held. Quote unquote, diamond. Deku would shatter the case with his gun, shooting the glass as it shatters, grabbing the glove and making his quick escape. As he runs, people now climbing the stairs, Deku would make it to the rooftop. Deku not being cornered as people had ascended the stairs would have two options, fight or try to escape. Deku would gaze over the edge of the building, seeing the 34 floor drop beneath him. Deku turning towards the stairwell as he pulls the oddly heavy glove onto his hand. The reason of course for this glove being codenamed Diamond is because of the insane cost the government had put into making it. The ultimate support item, costing over 1 billion in US dollars to create, and over 10 years in development and building and testing. This is version 1 of Diamond, the first nanotech technology that Japan has ever created. And now, the first anti-quirk weapon in Japan. Deku would jump off the side of the building, escaping the fight, as he slams his hand into the side of the building, the nanotech obeying his command, as the glove would slowly gain magnetism from the friction as he slows down the side of the building, making it just to the bottom without any scratches, the glove being perfectly fine as it rebuilds itself to its original form. Deku smirking as it worked. Deku would run, making his way up to the top of the tower where he had originally gotten his assignment, having now successfully stolen, quote unquote, what he was supposed to retrieve. As he arrives, the public safety commission would have already prepared his success letter. As Agent Nine would be offered two options. Suddenly, two floodlights would come on to him as he's reading this. Looking around, Deku would have his hand out prepared. However, you'd see there'd be 40 armed soldiers, all of AK-47s, all pointed at his chest. As Deku finishes reading the letter, You have two choices, Agent Nine. Death, or continue to live on and work for your country as a spy. Deku would smile, obviously knowing what his choice is. As Deku would then be debriefed on his mission, his mission to enter UA High as a potential hero candidate in Class 1A, and to find and smoke out the potential mole sent in from All for One's terrorist organization that one of their operatives has deemed will be entering into UA, although they have no idea who it could possibly be. Deku will be forced to investigate not only Class 1A, but Class 1B, Class C, as well as the support group classes as well effectively the entire year that he'll be entering with. All while avoiding suspicion from teachers or being found out by any of the staff at UA. It's from here where we see a new Izuku Midoriya several months later, with the UA entrance exam now taking place as he's walking in to take the exam. His hair color changed in order to hide his identity as Agent 9 walks forward to take the UA entrance exam for the number one top hero school in the world. We pick off right where we had left off. Izuku, or his now new alias of Luna, which means moon in Spanish, and just sounds awesome, would be his name. Not only that, but his last name would be Hagakoshi, because I just could not think of any other name. That said, like we've said, Deku at this moment would be getting ready to take the entrance exam, and doesn't actually end up bumping into Araka because this time he's not a nervous mess. He's going in with a goal, and that's it. He stays low key and keeps to himself for most of it, trying not to attract any attention from anybody and kind of keeping himself distant, just doing the test and yeah. One quick point will be that Deku, while he's in the test, is definitely going to be looking around at his surroundings, trying to see if anybody stands out as the mole or the traitor. That said, he would be sitting there with his support item on hand seeing as he is quirkless on his file and so the commission was actually allowing Deku to take his support item for the test. 
Ida, just like in the original, would still end up making a fool out of himself, and eventually, everybody would end up being told to go outside after the testing would have finished. This is when Deku would be outside waiting in a full tracksuit outfit, trying to simply go to the front, before Ida would actually step in the way and hold his hand over his shoulder with a firm grip. Deku's instincts would kick in, and it's at this point that Deku would flip Ida over his shoulder saying, Get your hit! Before realizing that, you know, he's not supposed to have reacted that way. Deku would immediately say, I'm so sorry, before Ida would say, like, what's your problem? Like, why would you slam me down? And Deku would say that it's his reflexes. He's sorry about that. He was trained that way. Ida would pretty much say that he just wanted to tell him not to go bother that girl over there. And Deku would say he simply wanted to make it to the front before bowing down to Ida, apologizing profusely. Deku at this point would have Ida look at him strangely as he would just say, it's fine, I'm, I, I got in your way, my bad, I read the whole situation wrong. And Ida would say that, you know, he's it's his bad, that he deserved it. From here, Deku would say, well, I'll hope to see you in the class, as Ida would say, you as well. And Deku would simply go to the front of the class, uh, not the classroom, but the front of the gate, where he proceeds to use his magnetized diamond, uh, diamond accessory to pretty much help him jump the wall. As soon as he does, a bunch of people in the crowd would immediately say, Hey, he's cheating. However, this is when President Mike would say, What are you guys talking about? A hero battle doesn't have a count countdown. He's doing exactly what he should do. You guys should follow in his example. As he would lower the gate and say, Go, 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 go. Immediately afterwards, everybody would begin rushing into the exam site as Deku would go on to destroy tons of one, two, and three point robots. Just enough to get him through the exam, getting a grand total of 42 robot points. He would have gone in there using his acrobatic skills as well as fighting style to rip off the limbs from robots and just utterly go down there and destroy them. Deku's physical strength is actually on a whole nother level and it's superhuman. Think Stain. So Deku is definitely going to be able to be dismantling a couple of robots, not to mention with his, uh, with his support item, he's able to go through this like light work. However, Deku would definitely be heavily holding back because he doesn't want to show his true colors and he doesn't want people to um, put their attentions too much on him. He simply wants to make sure that he is recognized for his talents and that people don't doubt him for, well, being quirkless. That said, Deku would be going on like this until the Zero Pointer would finally come in, and while Izuku was planning to simply run away after seeing the Zero Pointer and the crowd running, Deku would hear the screams of a girl, and this is when suddenly, Deku's heart would stop. He would look at the direction of Uraraka, who at this point looked as if she needed saving, and Deku's body, it, it, it moves, it moves on his own. Deku would think to himself, what am I doing? But his body would not let him stop. He would jump from rooftop to rooftop as he runs as fast as he possibly could, doing parkour across each part of the roof, until eventually he charges enough static electricity to the point where he jumps on top and grabs onto the robot with his magnetized glove before the electricity shock would blast, causing the robot to stop in place. And Deku would jump off of the robot as he would land on the floor and tumble, before he then rushes towards Uraraka and says, You okay? Uraraka would just be looking at Deku, who at this point just looks like a complete pro hero, and she would say, uh, yeah, but Deku, after this happens, he would put her on his shoulders before thinking to himself that he should not have done that. He clearly just made it look like he stand, he clearly just made himself stand out there, and that is exactly the opposite of what he wanted. He would think to himself that that's not a very good start to the mission, but ultimately would take Uraraka to Recovery Girl, where she would, you know, pretty much give her a lollipop and a kiss to heal her ankle. As from here, Uraraka would say, hey, wait, but Deku would be long gone. Everyone at this point would have been watching him and Deku feeling a little bit like uneasy at this would have ended up deciding to leave. He would decide to pretty much make his way back towards the Hero Commission where he would simply wait to find his acceptance letter, which for the following week, Deku would be looking at files regarding all of the students who would have passed the test, with Izuku being shocked that Bakugo, one of his childhood friends, is actually one of the people who passed, not being surprised that Todoroki was one of them seeing as he is the son of Endeavor, and he would think about all the possibilities of the lists of student who could be the UA trader, using his deductive skills to simply look at their files, their quirks, their fighting styles, and their record in middle school. 
couple of people would stand out to him, but he has no evidence to go based off of. So Deku would simply put these to the back of his mind and write them off as potential suspects. This would make him decide that he's going to be focusing on class 1A for a couple of months and branch out to class 1B as soon as he possibly can. After looking at these files for a while, he would decide to simply just get ready and we're going to be having a brief time skip to the first day of class. Now, Zuku's first day of class, better or worse, is basically going to be going like a usual day. He would be prompted by the Hero Commission that he will no longer be known as Agent 9 and would be given his, you know, his new fake alias as well as pro hero name that he's going to be choosing, but that's going to be revealed on a later date. That said, he would be briefed on everything and all the details of everything that he's going to be needing to do and also given a pro hero outfit, which Zuku is definitely going to be digging. That said, following this, we're going to be having a brief, small, little, wait, no, I actually already addressed this. The time skip to the first day of Yue High. Like I said, Izuku would take a train to school, and when he would finally arrive at the Yue doors, he would walk in to see Bakugo and Ida arguing. That's the first thing that he would see, and Deku would simply think back to his memories with Kachan or Bakugo, as, you know, he would get caught staring by Bakugo, who would go on to press him, saying, What you looking at, nerd? But Deku would say, Oh, nothing, my bad, as he would walk off to the back of the classroom. This is where he would simply go to sit back and observe as everybody is coming into the classroom and Deku would be watching everybody lifting his eyes and looking at his desk very quickly just getting brief glimpses of what everybody looks like and what they're doing in the classroom trying to make a sort of profile on every single person that is in his classroom realizing that you know this is going to be a little bit difficult following this a girl with brown hair would walk up towards Deku and she would say, Hey, I tried talking to you the other day. And Deku would look up to Uraraka. However, before she could say another word to Deku, this is when a man with uh, inside of a sleeping bag would pop up as Deku would notice this to be Aizawa, the pro hero eraser head. As Aizawa would say, it's taking you guys eight seconds to be quiet. That's not going to do. Throw these on and meet me outside. Uraraka would pause saying, but what about orientation? But Aizawa would simply say that he decides how his class is run and this is what he decided. So go put him on and meet him outside. This is when Deku would go to the changing room where a lot of people would actually notice the scars on Deku's body, with Kirishima pointing out that they're manly. This is when everybody would go outside and Deku would from here be told to throw the ball. But since he has no sort of support item, he would simply reel his arm back and he would get an impressive score of 105 meters. When Aizawa sees this, he would check Deku's files to see if he's truly quirkless and from here he would realize that yeah, the file's not lying. From here, Aizawa would go on to say you're incredibly strong for a quirkless kid. And Deku, as soon as he was told that he was, well, the first place and given the ball, Bakugo definitely would have gone angered, seeing as he thought he was going to be the one in first place, but apparently some quirkless kid beat him to it. A certain amount of rage would begin to boil within Bakugo, but what is he going to do? You know what I mean? It's a prestigious school. He's not just going to go around hitting people like he normally would at middle school. That said, this is when Deku would say that he's been training and he didn't just get into this prestigious school for no reason, saying that he put in the work and it's the fruits of his labor. The class would be shocked after hearing that Izuku is quirkless and he got a score of 105 meters. That's extremely impressive, even amongst pro heroes, that's something that not a lot of them could actually get. Not a lot of them that don't have super strength quirks. That said, Bakugo, like I said, would put a target on that quirkless kid's back and realize that he needs to show up in case, you know, this quirkless kid thinks that he's getting too ahead of himself. That said, keep in mind, he never ended up knowing that Deku is quirkless and also thinks he's dead. So he has absolutely zero suspicions on Deku, who just goes along with the rest of the exams. Following this, we would have this 50 meter dash, which Deku would complete with ease, actually racking up a very impressive score of whatever you guys think is impressive, because I, I don't know what an impressive score for the 50 meter dash is, say like uh, three seconds. No, 50 meters just can't be done. Like five seconds. I think that sounds decent or four, five or four seconds. That said, the next test would be the grip strength, and when Deku would go up there, he would get a score almost similar to that of Dupli Arms. 
as for the next test, it would be the standing long jump, and Deku would get a very, very impressive score. After that, they would have to do the repeated side to side steps, and once this happens, Deku would actually be having a very, very impressive score because his side to side steps is something that he often had to practice with his training to try to get quick on his feet. So Deku did very, very well and actually got second place in that. That said, the ball throw was up next and this time Deku was able to rack up a impressive 109 meters, throwing it just a little bit more powerful, putting a little more power into his throw than he did originally. That said, the three remaining tests would consist of push-ups, sit-ups, and planks, which Izuku would be the the top in all of them. All of those tests, Izuku would be the top in all of them. Following this, we would have Bakugo who was just absolutely shocked at Luna's performance, or as I'll re be referring to him, Deku's placement on the leaderboard. Seeing that Deku actually did almost as good as himself, seeing as he got the first place in all three of the last tests, Deku definitely solidified himself as a prime target of Bakugo. Seeing as he's quirkless and Bakugo is already thinking that he needs to show him up, Bakugo would take that as a huge hit to his ego, thinking that, you know, quirks are everything all his life and that he's the best, but all of a sudden, he's kind of being given a reality check. That said, this is when Aizawa would also end up telling them that, you know, that the member who would be expelled would be Mineta, because even though I forgot to mention this, the class would still think that this test was fun. And after Aizawa heard that, he gave them the challenge of fun, right? Well, then I guess you guys wouldn't mind if I spiced up the uh, the, the the goal or, or something like that. I, I don't know what words to exactly use right now. It's escaping me. But basically, he would tell the class that they are going to be needing to get the highest scores possible because the last one is going to be expelled from UA High. People would say that it's unfair and Aizawa would ultimately say life's unfair before taking Mineta, nodding to Deku, and taking Mineta to the office, where Mineta would promptly be expelled. Following this, Aizawa would tell Izuku that his skills as a quirkless individual are unparalleled, and that he definitely thinks Deku will be able to make a name for himself, that he's going to be needing to work harder than the rest of them, but that he sees, a pr he sees huge promise in Deku, saying that he reminds him of kind of what he was like because he never had a flashy quirk, and he fights with hand-to-hand -hand combat almost like what he expects Deku will. That said, he would then tell the entire class to leave. And it's at this point that Aizawa would proceed to just go home with everybody else doing this. That said, this would definitely shorten down the list of spies for all for one down for Deku. And after class, Deku would make sure to make a list on who the potential traitor could be. And Deku as a whole would begin acting different than what his real personality is. A more friendly, approachable person to make it easier for Deku to get close to as many of his classmates as possible. That said, about three days worth of Deku getting to know his classmates would pass and Deku would get a basic understanding of how his classroom is ran and how everyone acts so far. Deku doesn't have any leads, but he's definitely thinking of potential suspects with one of the prime ones being Invisible Girl. Since her quirk would allow her to slip by unnoticed very easily, Deku is definitely paying a ton of attention to her, or Hagakure, which is her real name. That said though, on the fourth day of class, Aizawa would be late to class and this is when suddenly All Might would pop up in the middle of the classroom saying, I am here, walking into the classroom like a normal person, as everybody in the class would be shocked and Deku seeing All Might in person would have a sense of nostalgia overcome him. Because as a kid, this was his hero, this was the person who he thought would someday save him in that hell that he grew up in. But now, Deku has become hardened and doesn't believe in somebody saving him. He doesn't even think that he'll ever be saved from the organization that he's a part of. And while Deku hates it, it's what he has to do to survive. Because if Deku denies it, he'll die. And what other choice does he really have? That said, this is when All Might would tell the classroom that he believes that the clothes that pro heroes wear is what makes them pros. And, you know, they would all be told that the clothes make the pros, in All Might's words, as everybody would go on to change into their hero outfits. And once this is done, everybody noticing Deku come from the back of the classroom as he was one of the last ones to be changed, the entire class would be focusing on Deku's costume and just how awesome it looks. He would have created a robotic arm with, to give him extra strength and support with his diamond support item. Very, very similar to the Winter Soldier, minus the star on his shoulder. 
That said, the grouping would commence, and for today's video, I decided I would take the liberty of actually randomizing the matches. And what I came up with will actually surprise many of you guys. It's going to be as follows, Izuku and Momo versus Kirishima and Ojiro. Or no, wait, no, not Ojiro, but Jiro, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm dumb. That said, now we're going to be getting into the battles themselves. Bakugo seeing that he's going to finally see Deku in action would think that he's going to be paying close attention to him, and everybody would be told and escorted to the area where they're going to be watching the battle. That said, I'm only going to be covering Deku's battle in this version since everything was randomized and I could not be bothered to cover everything. But keep in mind that after his battle, which will be first, Deku is going to be very paying extremely close attention to everybody else's quirks and how they work in order to gain more of an understanding on everybody in the class. That said, as soon as Momo would be paired with Izuku, she would feel pretty excited to be working alongside Deku who seems strong regardless of being quirkless and he would tell her that it will be climbing through the roof and she should create a heat signature device for him that he would go on to absorb in his nanotech which he would use to create a scouter-like thing that shows him the villain's location, or, you know, Kirishima and Jiro. That said, he would tell Momo that he'll go in from the top using his robotic arm to climb, and that she should go in from the actual roof. Oh no, not the roof, but the stairs, saying that if they both come in from opposite directions, they could split them up and get one-on-one -on -one battles going. That said, he would also tell her uh, to take this, as he would throw a stun gun at her direction and tell her how to use it. Jiro, or no, not Jiro, but he would tell her to use it on Jiro, as from here, he would tell her that he's going to be handling that Kirishima fellow, that he seems to be the strongest one out of the two, but not to let her guard down with Jiro, seeing as she has some sort of sound-based quirk, and from what he saw from her file, she's able to shoot out like sound waves with her quirk. That said, if everything goes to plan, they should win and he would tell her to go off based off his signal when she should enter. She would go on to agree with this plan, saying that she was thinking of doing almost the same thing, that a 2v2 approach would have been better, but that since she didn't know about Deku being able to magnetize his uh, support item, she was just going to suggest going and fighting them uh, you know, head on. But Deku's plan definitely does seem better. From this point, Deku would say, that, you know, yeah, his plan is pretty good, and Momo would ask him if he's sure he can take on Kirishima alone, before he would smile and say, oh, you doubt me because I'm quirkless? Don't worry about me, it's you I'm worried about, as he chuckles. <laughs> and from here, he would move her hair out of her face, before nodding and leaving Momo in a red state, like she is as red as a tomato, thinking that that kid is something else. That said, Deku at this point would climb up using his magnetized glove, and from here he would crash through the top of the window, with Jiro yelling, He's here! And Kirishima saying, Alright, finally, as he hardens himself with his quirk and clashes his fists together. From here, Deku would then go on to say, Sorry for crashing the party, but I wasn't invited. The battle would begin with Deku immediately yelling out the code work and from behind, Momo would bust open the door and shoot her gun at Jiro which hits her and sends her to the ground, taking her out immediately as Kirishima would turn around to say what? No! But from here, Deku would rush in saying pay attention to me as he punches Kirishima with an uppercut sending Kirishima flying back and Kirishima from here would get back up saying that that was one hell of a blow, <laughs> that he almost felt that one, as he would rush in and try to fight Deku hand to hand, but Deku would outclass him in every way, shape, and form, and Kirishima would be unable to land a single blow against Deku. With Deku changing his his uh, his fighting style up every so often to make sure Kirishima doesn't find out what the pattern is, Deku would be using his multiple fighting styles to completely overcome Kirishima's hardening. Not only that, but he would also be using one of the knives that he has attached to his leg holster to fight uh, Kirishima with his other arm being metal, so he's able to actually attack him and land a little bit of damage every single time. Now, the goal that he's trying to get to is that since Kirishima isn't able to even attack back, Deku would seriously just be changing, would be, sorry, not changing, but charging up his blow to finally be able to stun Kirishima long enough to use capture tape on him, and with his left hand, like I said, would be using a blade from his leg holster to keep Kirishima's attacks at bay. 
and to apply pressure on him, seeing as he can't hit him with his fist because, you know, that would just be idiotic. That said, he would continue like this for about a minute until Kirishima would send Deku flying back with a blow as he would finally land an attack, and Deku would land pretending to get up slowly as if he was hurt. During this time, Kirishima would use this moment of weakness to rush in at Deku, as Deku would say, CHECKMATE, as he would shock Kirishima and wrap capture tape around him immediately, catching the dub. From here, All Might would praise Izuku and Momo for their impressive performance, and after this, Deku would tell Momo she did a great job, as from here, he'd go on to observe the rest of the matches. With everybody being like, whoa, I didn't know you were this impressive. The class would be shocked at Deku's performance seeing as he is quirkless and he's doing all of this amazing stuff without a quirk. This would begin to change some of the students' perspectives on quirkless people and it would make them believe that maybe they do have a chance at becoming pro heroes just like them. This would prompt a bunch of them to think that if a quirkless kid is catching up this fast, maybe that just means that they have to step up their game. And a bunch of them would agree. From here, this is when, like I said, he would go on to observe the matches, with him going home at the end of the day to his assigned home with fake parents as to make it seem as if he has a normal life. That said, he would then write down more info and from here, about one week of Deku getting to know his classmates would go by with him creating detailed assessments on each one of them and reporting them to the Hero Commission, starting with Yugo Aoyama. His classification would be strange, weirdo, he likes to stand out, and he, as of now, doesn't have anything to stand out. Mina Ashido, she seems to be an outgoing girl with a very interesting acidic quirk, and she doesn't seem to be in, in any uh, potentiality to be the traitor. Next, we have Suyu Asui, she's a frog girl, quite timid, she's also outgoing at the same time, and she does not seem to be the traitor. Tenya Ida. Flash rep, he is a little bit of a stick in the mud and he is not exactly the kind of guy he would expect to be the traitor. Ochako Uraraka, she has an insanely powerful gravity quirk that with training could become very deadly later on and she has a bubbly personality. Next, Ojiro, tail, quirk, very basic. Deku doesn't see him as a potential traitor seeing as his quirk doesn't really seem as if it could help him with that. Next. Denki Kaminari. Now, Kaminari's profile would be a little strange because Kaminari's personality would be a little bit difficult for Deku to wrap his hand around, seeing as he hasn't had quite as much detail on him. However, he would say that he he has a lightning quirk and that Denki Kaminari is an outgoing person. Eijiro Kirishima. He would give his profile as that uh, manly character, I guess you could say, with a outgoing personality and an extroverted nature. Kyoji Koda. He would say that he's an introverted person with a pretty powerful and unique quirk that with training could potentially go on to be a very powerful quirk. Then we have Sato, the man who eats sugar for his power. Deku thinks that he's not even in contention to be one of the traitors. And next we have Shoji, the man who can turn parts of his bodies into other extensions and limbs. Deku would say that his quirk is pretty interesting but nothing noteworthy. Next, Jiro. Deku's profile of her would be that she definitely needs a lot more in terms of like experience to grow. She seems to be more of an introverted person in nature and she is un utterly just kind of bland. Next, we have Sato or Saro, sorry. He would say that his personality is pretty much extroverted, that he doesn't seem to see any red flags within himself. Next would be Tokiyami. With Deku saying that he seems to be interesting, seeing as he has somewhat of a villainous quirk, however, it seems as if his intentions are pure. Next, Shoto Todoroki, the son of Endeavor, with quirk, name, half hot, half cold. He would pretty much put him in the ranks of being a very powerful person, but holds himself back with his quote unquote daddy issues. Next, Tomuru, Toru Hagakuri. He would say that she's definitely a potential to be the UA trader, seeing as her quirk in nature could let her do so many things to be a perfect trader. After that, he would say Katsuki Bakugo. Is he the trader? Deku would say unknown, but he would say that he used to know him as a kid, saying that Bakugo has a very extroverted personality and a god complex at that. Next would be Momo Yayorozu. He would say easy on the eyes. It lacks confidence and she's a little bit of a mix between extroverted and introverted saying that she could go on to become a very valuable asset in the pro hero society 
after this, the commission would look at his report and say that he's doing well as of now, telling him to continue as he would leave, arriving home hours later to finally rest for the day. The next day, he would arrive in class with a signed permission slip from his quote unquote parents as they would make their way to the USJ, where the entire class would go on to meet 13 and she would go on to give her awfully boring speech. The class would be paying attention to 13 when suddenly out of nowhere a strange portal would appear in the middle of the USJ. Deku seeing this would look towards Aizawa who would seem as if he's shocked with Kirishima saying, whoa, nice, they have fake villains. But Aizawa would seem not to think this when he would jump down and say, the run, those are not fake villains. As from here, everybody would proceed to kind of try to like be on guard, but it's too late. It's at this moment that Bakugo and Kiyoshima would jump in, but they would not be able to hit Kurigiri. And from here, Kurigiri would teleport the entire school to a different location in the USJ. Now, the locations would be basically the same ones that they were in canon. And once Deku sees this, he would realize that, yep, villains are definitely here. He would try to swim out of the water and would end up actually getting caught off guard by a villain that would hit him away underwater. Deku would be mid-fight when out of nowhere Suyu would wrap her tongue around him, shooting him up into the boat as she would jump up in there with nobody else in hand because keep in mind, Mineta isn't part of the story this time. And so, this is when Deku would pretty much ask Suyu, you know, why she's here. Like, he, she should not be there at all, seeing as she's a water quirk user. And so he would deduce that the villains have no idea what their quirks are, that they kind of just sporadically spread them around, trying to catch them all off guard. And so Deku would proceed to tell her that the best course of action from here would be to steer the boat away from the water, where they'll have the advantage as Deku would steer the boat towards the shore and villains would begin running towards their direction. This is when Suyu would jump off the boat and as, as of this moment, villains would begin rushing them. But as this happens, Aizawa, who would be nearby, would jump in saying that they need to go now, with Suyu and Mineta going, but Deku staying, getting into more fighting. Oh, and by the way, I know I said Suyu and Mineta, but keep in mind, Mineta's expelled. It's just a habit. Anyways, though, that said, he would stay into his fighting position, and out of nowhere would jump in Aizawa as he has his uh, Erasure Quirk activated. And from here, using Aizawa's fighting skills as well as Erasure Quirk with Deku's tenacity, talent, strength, and just ability to fight multiple targets at once would begin to dismantle tons of villains alongside Aizawa as Deku was able to fight perfectly alongside Aizawa as if he'd known him his entire life. And this is when Shigaraki would be triggered. As Deku and um, Aizawa would be getting done with the last of the villains, you would hear Shigaraki in the background saying, Nomu, kill him. And suddenly, a strange giant creature would appear out of nowhere as it would roar to the heavens before rushing in at Aizawa's direction, hitting him directly in the ribs, sending him flying. Deku, upon seeing this, would realize that he needs to get out of the way now. He would jump in front of one of the last remaining villains as he would jump over him, doing using his acrobatic skills to get over him as the Nomu sends the villain flying back with a punch roaring at the direction of Deku, but Deku would look at the villain or the Nomu as he would decide that he has no idea how to take this guy out. He would rush in and throw a punch and a kick at the Nomu, with Deku being shocked at how powerful this thing is. It's so strong. Deku's hits didn't even budget. Deku would realize this and that without a quirk, he's probably going to stand no chance. So he needs more equipment, but he doesn't have any. So he would proceed to jump back and try to dodge as many of the Nomu's attacks, but its speed, tenacity, strength, its sheer grit fighting against Deku would be so much that Deku would have such a hard time overcoming this. Deku would jump, dodge, he would sweep under, try to kick the Nomu, try to go for any weak points that Deku could sense, but nothing would work. And suddenly, Aizawa would get back up as he uses his erasure quirk and the Nomu suddenly doesn't seem that powerful. His healing properties begin to go away. However, they couldn't notice this because they haven't damaged the Nomu. It's at this moment where Shigaraki would begin laughing saying, the Nomu will not be defeated by somebody like you. It was made to kill all my... Revealing to Deku and Aizawa the quirks that the Nomu has. As Deku would say, regeneration and shock absorption, eh? Sounds interesting. I didn't hear him mention super strength. 
I guess that might just be how strong this thing is. He would jump back as he jumps into the air and using his metal arm with his nanotech weapon code Diamond would punch down as he would hit the brain of the Nomu. But the Nomu would seem as if it wasn't even shocked as it would grab Deku by the arm and it would slam him onto the ground with Deku coughing out blood being like... <laughs> But this is when out of nowhere, Aizawa would jump in and shoot a scarf at the Nomu's arm, stopping the Nomu from landing an even more attacks on Deku. This would give Deku just enough time to get back up, as he would rush in before the Nomu was able to hit Aizawa. And it would just be this cycle of Aizawa trying to defend Deku and Deku trying to defend Aizawa, as they're both trying to hold the Nomu off for as long as possible, trying to think of any ways at all to deal with the Nomu's. But as it would seem, hope was getting lower and lower because they realize that they can't take him out. Regardless, once hope is almost lost, All Might would show up with a smile on his face and rage in his face as soon as he sees everything as he would go on to solo the Nomu, just like he does in canon. And from here, this is when the group would finally be able to recoup and Deku and Aizawa would go off somewhere to try to take out more villains. From here, with you know the Nomu being defeated, Shigaraki and Kuragiri would end up retreating and everybody would meet outside alongside a bunch of police officers who would ask them where they were and to confirm stories with each other, finding out about Aoyama specifically saying that the place that he was at was a secret. Deku after hearing this would say, come on Aoyama, you can't expect us to just believe anything, right? Where were you? But Aoyama would be like, ah, I was over here being beautiful, trying to dodge the question as much as possible, saying that it's a secret. But suddenly, he would hear Invisible Girl's story about how she was near Todoroki. But Todoroki would be shocked because he didn't remember her being anywhere near, saying that he probably could have frozen her on that landslide. And from here... He would also begin to question Todoroki to find out that, you know, he didn't know she was even there. He would also find out about Kaminari and think that he could be a potential suspect as well, since his quirk could potentially be used to jam signals, seeing as it is lightning or electricity. And after, he would create a new list of potential suspects, saying the others appear to be fine. However, three suspects appear as the major people who could potentially be Kaminari, Invisible Girl and Aoyami. That said, from here, the students would be given an entire week off of school, which Deku would use to train and also request new gear and some upgrades to his new suit, like adding new features to his mask to let him breathe underwater and in smoke if the occasion was to ever present itself, also requesting it to be more lightweight since his movements were slowed down when he was fighting against the Nomu, something that he noticed early on as soon as he put the suit on. And since he knows the sports festival was going to be coming soon, he would request to use his support items in it since it would help him greatly. So, yeah, class would eventually start up in about one week. And from here, Deku would have also uh, informed the hero commission that he needs explosive type weapons with a suit. Powerful ones at that because fighting against Nomu made him realize that he's not always going to be having an easy way out and that he needs to think of new ways to fight against villains such as, you know, powerful ones that are just so insanely focused on brute force that it's just impossible to basically defeat them or do any damage to them whatsoever. That said, as I was saying, class would start and the class would be informed of the UA Sports Festival with classes 1B and all of the rest trying to go scope out the competition. Araraka, just like usual, would begin getting extremely hyped up saying, I'm ready! Are you ready? But I digress. That said, Deku would pretty much end up playing close attention to his suspects, involving himself with Kaminari and Kirishima's friend group since he's a potential suspect. And the UA Sports Festival would finally be around the corner, with Deku being the person to give a speech instead of Bakugo since he was the one who actually got the most points in the entrance mm -hmm. exam, seeing as he had a total of 42 plus 60 rescue points. So. That's what would happen. Deku would go forward to give an amazing speech with the crowd cheering and also letting them know that he's quirkless. The crowd upon hearing this would actually go silent, but Deku would then tell everybody to try their best and the crowd would then be happy and cheer, with a little bit of muttering in the crowd thinking, there's no way they're going to let that quirkless kid go, right? What if he gets hurt? But then... This is when Midnight would go up, taking the microphone from Deku, hyping the crowd up once again, and telling them all that the first event will be... A 
obstacle course or a race. As everybody would begin getting suited up in their in their outfits, this is when everybody would be getting on the starting lineup. As just like usual, Todoroki would freeze the lineup as soon as the whistle would be blown and Deku would jump knowing that this was going to definitely happen. Deku at this point would proceed to take the technology from his arm and it would begin shifting down to his body. The nanotech would begin going down his body and sliding to the bottom of his feet. Deku would begin using his nanotech to pretty much charge up heat at the bottom of his soles that would pretty much melt the ice every time that he would step so Deku would run and not be bothered by the ice. Matter of fact, instead of milking the ice, let's say that Deku just creates like some shoes that are actually able to walk on ice. And so Deku is able to rush across the ice no problem, with everybody else being thrown off guard and Bakugo flying in the air using his explosions to pretty much get ahead of the competition. That said, this is when the race would continue going on as Deku would meet his first couple of obstacles, the zero pointers. Deku would look up as he would see these monstrosities, but Deku would know that he simply needs to calm down and go at this thinking of everything that could possibly happen. Seeing as there's three zero pointers this time and they're all ready to attack, Deku would have rushed in at one, the one in the middle, as he would use his magnetized glove quirk once more to pretty much grab onto the zero pointer, causing it to shut down mid mid punch as Deku was able to blow right past it and using his enhanced speed by you know being a superhuman would begin catching up slowly to Todoroki and Bakugo who were way ahead of the competition but at this point Deku would end up making his way towards an obstacle course with a bunch of holes on the ground and it seems very very difficult to get across however Deku would start using his parkour abilities to jump from one edge to another as quickly as possible when eventually he would end up getting to the landmine section and once Deku sees this he would decide that that's perfect he would absorb one of the landmines into his nanotech wasting a little bit of time but then he would decide that a good idea would be the same one that Izuku would have made in the original. Grabbing a piece of a robot part, he would end up actually taking it as he begins to stack a bunch of bombs on each other and he would blow himself to the front of the finish line as this time instead of actually being able to surpass Bakugo and Todoroki, he would make it past uh he would end up instead of like using their shoulders to jump off he would pretty much land a little bit behind them using a little less explosions than in the original and after landing he would pretty much spin on the floor as he rolls to his feet and then begins running towards the direction of Todoroki and Bakugo however Todoroki would freeze the ground saying stay back quirkless kid quirkless uh runt as you know from here Bakugo would say yeah you pest as he would be shooting his explosions but ultimately Todoroki would be the winner of the race and from here it would be announced that the cavalry battle is going to be the next event and so from here Deku not being in first place would actually have a huge amount of people who he could actually pick from when it comes to his squad and so what he would end up doing is picking his squad with Deku while this is all happening being told by Bakugo not to get too ahead of himself after you know getting second place and telling him that he's still quirkless at the end of the day and that even if he came at third place that was luck he would say it's fine and by he i mean deku but would be thinking that bakugo definitely grew up to be a prick later on in life but it's whatever that said he would go on to participate in the squad thingy whatever and from here his team would be comprised of kaminari momo yayarozu and ochako or rock. We pick off with the story right where I had left off on part 3. With the team being assembled, we now have Izuku formulating a plan as to how his team is going to be winning. After all, his members aren't exactly going to be adding too much in terms of like helping him get the final headband, since he only has Kaminari, Momo, and Uraraka. That said, Deku decides that instead of devising their attention on the million point headband, Deku would opt to instead go and try to get weaker headbands in order to stay in the main competition. That way he can focus all of his attention in the final battles, which he knows will be something that he's going to be needing a bit more of his energy for. That said, it'll be the most safest gamble to make sure that he, uh, that he gets to the finals of the sports festival. 
That said, this is when we would have it so that his team would end up doing this and kind of just collecting the small headbands from lower teams. That said, his team would pretty much end up getting second place with Todoroki's being in first after he him being able to kind of, I guess you could say, keep his headband. With Bakugo keeping his points that he got with his uh, second place and being dead last. Seeing as he barely was able to um, like scrape by after Deku ended up stealing a bunch of headbands from other teams. And so Bakugo having any points at all was able to barely pass by. Like I said, dead last. That said, after this, we're going to be having the main battles be announced, with Deku's first battle being against Shinso, just like he would be in the original. However, I'm not even going to sugarcoat this or act like this battle is about to be something insane. Because of Deku growing up as a spy and being trained not to let his emotions guide his actions, Deku, when he fights against Shinso and Shinso would immediately try to get Deku to talk, Deku would not do a single thing. And seeing as Shinso isn't able to say something like, oh, it's so nice having a quirk, Deku doesn't say any of that because everybody knows that Deku's already quirkless. So Shinso tries to just talk smack on Deku, his outfit, the people that was on his team, yada, 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 but Deku doesn't care. He would immediately rush Shinso, knock him out, giving him the victory, taking him out swiftly and almost painlessly. This would lead to Deku becoming a fan favorite with the fans and people would start wondering if maybe quirkless people can become heroes. Maybe quirkless people have potential after all. It's interesting. Many people have had their emotions swayed all because of this kid, Luna Hagakoshi. It's insane, but it's what's happening. That said, Deku would become a symbol to all quirkless people during the festival and his popularity would rise as I said already. But Todoroki, he's not exactly a big fan of some quirkless kid getting all this attention, even more than him. And if he's being honest with himself, it's rubbing him the wrong way. So during the time that they have before their second battle, seeing as he's going to be going up against Deku pretty soon, he would actually go up to Deku and tell him to stop acting as if he's even part of the competition. A quirkless person like him, will make it far. Saying that in the next match, he'll crush him and remind him of just how powerless he is. But Zeku, he would put on a straight face and say, well, he'll just do his best and if he loses, so be it. But he's going to get as far as he can, standing in front of Todoroki, holding his ground, telling him that he's not afraid of him just because he has a quirk. But internally, Deku would be thinking of how badly he wants to knock Todoroki down a few pegs and take him down right then and there. That said though, he would inevitably end up making his way towards the arena and he would bump into Endeavor, who would actually tell him to get Shoto to use his fireside, telling him a bit of details about Todoroki and Deku would use this to his advantage. He would ask Endeavor why he wants him to do it, and Endeavor would promptly tell him that Shoto has some sort of daddy issues with him, that he doesn't like using his fireside because he believes it's his quirk, but he doesn't understand it, telling the kid that that's all he needs to know, and that if he can get him to use his fire quirk, then uh, you know he'll reward him in some way, shape, or form. Deku would say that the reward was you telling me that. Thanks for the information, old man, as he would proceed to walk towards the arena, thinking to himself, that that's exactly how he's going to be defeating Todoroki. Seeing as Todoroki is going to be fighting against Deku in an open area, and Todoroki has the advantage of being able to shoot him from far distance, seeing as Deku is a close range fighter, it's going to be extremely difficult for him to even defeat Todoroki whatsoever, much less get close to him. That said, when he would finally make it to the arena, Deku would look at Todoroki before the match starts and says, It's a shame you don't use your flames. You might be unstoppable if you did, but since you don't, this will be a breeze. Todoroki would look at him with an angry expression on his face, as Deku would then go on to say, Regardless, this is nothing, and you're nothing without your quirk, which would actually hit a spot for Todoroki. Following this, Deku would go on to say, You know I'm right, Todoroki. The only thing you have going for yourself is your Endeavor son, and even then, you hate your own dad. <laughs> Daddy issues much. Todoroki, after hearing this, would say, What would you know? as the proctor would say that the match just starts, and it's at this point that Todoroki would say, how dare you speak on me without even knowing me, as he would shoot his eyes at Deku, who would punch his fist straight into the ice, causing himself to be lifted up as the ice would shoot in a huge pillar. Just like it would have in the original, Deku would actually be like gripped onto the ice, 
and as soon as the ice pillar would have been formed, Todoroki would be expecting that to be the end of it. However, Deku would begin climbing the ice and using his um his nanotech would actually be able to create a spiky like thing that he's able to use to climb to the top which would cause Deku to pretty much be able to rush at Todoroki sliding down the ice in his direction and from there he would actually have a second of Todoroki not being shocked at what just happened and so Todoroki would shoot a second ice geyser which Deku would flip over and from here he'd go on to taunt Todoroki telling him look at that scared of a quirkless kid getting close I can't believe it the great Shoto Todoroki <laughs> playing at Todoroki's ego, using this to get ahead of Todoroki, playing mind games because he knows that if Todoroki simply just continues keeping him away, Todoroki is going to win. There's nothing Deku could do about it. His quirk is simply better in this situation. And Deku doesn't want to fight in a situation that he knows he'll lose, so he's trying to bend things to his own way. Let's say Todoroki and Deku are fighting in an open area where it's not a tournament area. Deku's probably going to be able to figure out a way to beat him, but Todoroki has all the cards in his favor. That said, this strategy would sort of begin working on Todoroki as he would stop for a second, giving Deku enough time to get closer as Deku was almost able to land a hit and Todoroki would back up abruptly, using a wall of ice to actually um, get between himself and Deku, but Deku would smash straight through it and he would say, big mistake as from here he would go on to land a powerful blow on Todoroki by the way I've been watching a lot of enemy X but anyway it would send Todoroki flying back and Deku wouldn't stop the onslaught from there he would use his speed to kick him away and Todoroki would stop himself from falling off of the edge with this ice as Deku would rush in not giving Todoroki a second to breathe continuing with the onslaught as Todoroki uses his flames to make Deku have to jump back but from here, Endeavor would yell in the crowd saying, SHOTO! As from here, Deku would say, look at that, a quirkless kid to make you use your full power. What a disappointment. Todoroki, feeling what he had just done, would say that it won't happen again. As he would shoot a wall of ice at Deku, that he would be able to dodge. And from there, Deku would try going around Todoroki, but he would shoot another wall of ice at Deku's direction, which would leave him kind of trapped in a hallway-like state. From here, Deku would be like, oh, how do I, as from here, Todoroki would begin shooting a huge pillar of ice at him, but Deku would use the ice from each side to jump from side to side over to the, over the attack that Todoroki would have just shot at him. As from here, he would use his arm to charge up a huge amount of power as he would slam his fist into the ice, causing it to shatter. As from here, Deku would go into beast mode and cover both fists with nanotech as he would proceed to absolutely pound Todoroki into the ground and spit on him, adding extra disrespect as Izuku or Luna would be declared the victor. From here, the crowd would go absolutely wild and from here, Deku would decide that Maybe he should step back and lose the next match, but he would think that maybe standing out isn't so bad. He's enjoying this. How often will he get to live moments like this? And so he would end up getting ready for his next match with Bakugo and Todoroki would end up being taken by Recovery Girl. As from here, Deku would be given about 20 minutes of rest before having to fight the finalist, Bakugo Katsuki. That said, from here Deku would decide that Bakugo might be harder to fight against seeing as he could actually fly to gain distance with his explosions and he'd be wondering what he has to do to win, thinking to himself that knowing Bakugo, he'll do what it takes to win, but he also knows Bakugo doesn't accept winning unless he beats them 100%, unless it's a clear cut victory. And so he's unsure if Bakugo will take that approach or if he'll be unsatisfied with that, seeing as Bakugo himself probably knows that Deku would have him beat in close to hand uh, hand to hand combat, but if he doesn't beat him there, that means he's fighting Deku when he's not at his best, and he doesn't know if Bakugo would be willing to do something like that. That said, the match would be called, and Bakugo versus Deku would commence, and so the final battle would finally commence. Deku would immediately get ready as he would crack his knuckles as Midnight would say go and from here Bakugo would immediately blast off into the air using his explosions to create distance as from here in the air Bakugo would uh, begin to shoot explosions at Deku which would be barely able to hitting which Deku would dodge by just jumping out of the way before promptly saying come on Bakugo you know I can't reach you up there Bakugo would start laughing saying you quirkless bastard I know you can't get me up here this is why I'm gonna win 
But Deku from this moment would say, that's not the Bakugo I used to know. The Bakugo I know would have beaten somebody without any second doubts, would have beaten somebody at their best. It's a shame you went this low to beat a quirkless kid. Bakugo, after hearing this, it would touch a nerve within him as he would think to himself, he's right. And from here, Bakugo would land on the ground before looking at Deku with a solemn expression on his face saying, <laughs> fine, before it returned to that of a cocky expression and Bakugo would rush in with explosions on hand, throwing different amounts of explosions at Deku's, at Deku's area. This is when Deku would decide that he definitely needs to cover his face before it gets scorch marks. And so, using his nanotech, he would create a mask to cover his face. As from here, Deku would simply turn towards Bakugo as he begins engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Deku would throw blow after blow after blow, kick, rolling around, dodging, sweeping the leg, and Bakugo would use his explosions to keep Deku at bay, trying to keep him away as long as possible. But Deku is not giving up, and every time that Bakugo would throw a blow, Deku would counter it with an elbow to Bakugo's face, a punch to the stomach, an uppercut which would have sent Bakugo back flying. The crowd would be going wild as this would be the most exciting battle the entire time. Obviously we saw the fight between Kirishima and Tetsu Tetsu go down where it was literally all physical but this is different because both of them are actually taking damage it's not a, a, a stamina issue and both of them are just you know they're both talented in their own right however Deku would start taking things up a notch beginning to show his true colors just for a split second allowing him to use his real skills to immediately grab onto one of Bakugo's arm and pretty much snap it out of place Bakugo would yell out and from here, he would throw another explosion with his left arm, trying to keep Bakugo at bay. Or no, Deku. But Deku would rush in and sweep Bakugo's legs as he holds him to the ground, and then from there proceeds to hit Bakugo square in the jaw. As Bakugo gets knocked out from there, and Bakugo is just laying on the ground. As Deku would stand back up and hold his fist up in the air, as he would say, I won. And from here, the crowd would lose their minds. Like, everybody's like, oh my god! Izuku or no not Izuku Midoriya but Luna won from here the crowd would be just going absolutely insane and Deku would now be an official fan favorite with from here Deku feeling so happy thinking to himself so this is what it's like to feel like a, a hero this is what I've always wanted so then why why can't I enjoy it but he'd remember this isn't real I won't have this in a year or two or three. I'll just go back to being a pawn. And Deku would have this thought in his mind all day, even while he was being given the medal for having first place. And even when pictures of him would go viral all over social media with people saying that quirkless people might have the potential to become pro heroes after all. However, he would go to sleep with this thought in his mind and he would not be able to enjoy the day. But the next day, he would end up arriving at school, where he would end up deciding on what his pro hero name is going to be. And he would end up choosing the name Endu. The way that you spell it would be E N D U E Y? N N D U? No, no, no. N N D U. I don't know. But just know that it's pronounced Endu, okay? And from here, he would choose to intern alongside Kaminari. After everybody else would end up picking their own internships, Deku would pick Kaminari's internship, as he would respectfully end up going with the pro hero, Kamui Woods. Because, I mean, why not? It sounds likely. We never end up finding out who Kaminari truly ends up interning with, and Deku wants to find out as much as Kaminari to make sure that Kaminari is not the UA traitor. Deku has actually grown a little bit of a liking towards Kaminari, and so far his suspicions have been lowered, but he can't be too sure until after this. So. Like I said, he would decide an internship alongside the internship that Kaminari will be going to. And so, this new arc will be starting. Instead of going to Gran Torino and All Might giving, you know, Deku one for all like in the original, he's going to be trying to do as much detective work as he possibly could, trying to see if Kaminari will let anything slip up. So far, he hasn't. And so far, he hasn't even been showing any signs of being able to use his quirk in the way that he theorized. So... Deku just hopes he's right because Kaminari seems like a great guy and he doesn't want him to end up being the traitor after all. 
That said though, this is when Deku would end up going home just like usual after picking his pro hero that he's going to be interning with and he wouldn't even end up telling Kaminari that he's going there. He would simply write it off after hearing Kaminari say that he's going to go to Kamui Woods. Seeing as this time, Kaminari did pretty well in the sports festival just like usual but ended up, ended up losing to the girl with the plant thing because you know she has like an earth based ability which pretty much is the perfect counter to him. But with the right type of training and mentorship, Kamui Woods sees potential in him. Not only that, but that new kid would definitely bring a little bit of talk to his internship, so that's why he ended up sending one to Deku. That said, this is when Deku would end up going home, like usual, and end up pretty much updating his, his notes on, you know, who the potential threat to UA could be. Deku would pretty much end up crossing off Bakugo as a whole just because he doesn't feel like he could be. Bakugo has always wanted to be a hero, and he doubts in any way, shape, or form that he could potentially ever be the villain. So, he crosses him off of his list, and a lot of other people begin getting crossed off as well. With Momo being somebody that Deku clearly knows, she is definitely having a crush on him. She has the hots for him. Uraraka definitely has a little bit of a liking towards Deku, seeing as she definitely wanted to join his team, and he noticed that Uraraka seemed to get a little jealous when Momo joined the squad. But it is what it is, and Deku couldn't even act on that even if he wanted to, because, you know, he is a spy at UA. He's not there to have fun. He's there to do his job. And so, with that said, the day where they would inevitably have to go towards the internship would arrive, and Deku would end up taking a train alongside Kaminari, as both of them would have conversation with each other, saying that it's pretty sweet that they're both going to be interning at the same place, Kaminari would say. As Deku would say, yeah, thinking to himself, if only you knew Kaminari but I can't tell you that until I'm sure. But from here, Deku would go on to smile at Kaminari as the bus ride would be a long one and they would finally end up arriving at Kamui Woods' internship. In, uh, uh, no, not internship, but uh, pro hero agency, his, his agency, right? From here, Deku would walk in through the doors as everybody would be like, Yo, oh, you're that kid, right? You know, everybody would be hyped up to have Izuku there, or more commonly known as Luna, saying that his performance in the UA Sports Festival was totally incredible and that somebody like him was needed to bring some freshness to the hero society. Seeing as there's never been another quirkless hero in the world, and he's the first, he's making headlines. So his being there at the agency is so good for publicity. However, this is when Kamui Woods would come out and say, all right, all right, leave the kids down. They're here to internship with me. It's from here, he would begin showing them around and telling them that they better be ready because they're in for a hell of a learning experience. Deku and Kaminari would both look at Kamui as they would say, right. They begin learning day after day with Kamui. And so overall, Kaminari would actually begin advancing with his finesse and his quirk overall also would come to realize a bunch of major flaws that he would actually end up turning into shrinks with the agency. Not only that, but the internship experience that they're going to be having is going to be extremely similar to that of the Endeavor internship that we were actually able to see in season 4 or 5, I believe. That said, they're able to actually go through and complete a couple of tasks following Kamui Woods with his hero work, with Deku following Kaminari around and tracing his every single move, trying to make sure that he doesn't miss even a single instant of Kaminari's, you know, what he's doing and such. And so, Deku ends up doing a great job all in all in the Kamui Woods internship, making Kamui actually point out that he moves like a pro himself. But Deku just says that he's just trying his best and he would end up toning it down a couple of notches. And during this time, Deku would have the opportunity to take off all of Kaminari's data from his phone by inserting a chip into it which would end up transferring all of his data the second that he was given the chance. And so, he's finally able to uncover that Kaminari likes his girls thick and also that he isn't the mom. He ends up finding that out pretty quick just by seeing that Kaminari seems to have a relatively normal life, his personality doesn't really indicate anything dangerous to Deku, and so Deku is honestly happy. He would continue his agency experience, overall having a good time, learning a bunch of things from the Hero Society and how to actually run a agency himself in case he ever gets the opportunity to do something like this himself. I mean, it always has been his dream, but he never has exactly been given the opportunity to dream. He's always been forced to do things for other people since he can remember. And so, like I said, he would end up establishing a good friendship with Kaminari that wouldn't really last too long seeing as it's just a mission. However, after all this time with the agencies over, all the students would end up returning back to class where they're all briefed on the death of class 1A rep. 
Tenya Ida. With no Deku there to save him, he dies trying to avenge his brother. And so, the class attends his funeral instead of having some race like in the original, meaning the obstacle course. After the funeral, Deku is told to report to the Hero Commission, where he is told that his recent performance, while good, isn't what he needs to do, to stop being so flashy and getting attached to the mission. Deku, upon hearing this, would say that they complain an awful lot for somebody who just uses him. And so, he would walk away with a chip down saying that one more person isn't the thief, and that Class 1A is almost pretty much done being looked into, that he just needs about two more suspects to go. As he would begin walking away, saying the mission will be done pretty soon if one of them is in, the cl in Class 1A. As he would walk off, and in the doorway would stand none other than Hawks, as he would say, You put on quite a show back there, kid. Deku would turn around and see bright red wings and the blonde hair as he would say, Kaigo, is that? As Hawks interrupts him and says, After all this time, you haven't come looking for me once, Izuku. How cold. And Deku would have a smile on his face as he says, Well, he's been a little busy as he rubs the back of his head with a mission. And from here, Hawks would wrap his arm right around Deku as he would say, It's been quite a while. Let's catch up, you and me. And Deku would simply nod as he would say, You haven't changed a bit. Then, Kaigo would say, call me Hawks, as Deku would laugh and say, oh, we're using our pretend names? Sure, call me Endu. As from here, they end up arriving at a bar as Deku gets in with a fake ID and they catch up with drinks, reminiscing on the old days and what's happened to Hawks after being away for so long. He would explain his situation and then ask about everything that's happened to Deku. As Deku would explain his own side of the story, with Hawks having a pretty similar reaction to what Deku did, but that he had very different training once Hawks left, saying that he's come a long way since then, with Hawks saying, yeah, I bet, and following that with just saying, I'm glad. And Deku would say about, as Hawks would say, that we were wrong about weeding out the weak, and things turning out the way that they did. As Deku would say, oh yeah, I was quite shocked when I came to find out that a quirkless kid like me was able to do all the things I was able to, but things worked out in the end. And Hawks would say, yeah, I was shocked as well when I came to find out that some quirkless kid named Luna was after, was you, after looking into the timeline and seeing that you fit the description perfectly. And that change of style definitely suits you, Izuku. As from here, Deku would laugh saying that he got the rough end of the stick, explaining his situation to Hawks. And then Hawks would go on to ask him about, you know, how he is doing his mission. Deku says things are going fine, and so far he found out another person wasn't the mole. And he would ask Hawks about what it's like to be a hero, and not having anybody tell him what to do. But Hawks would say, eh, that's where you're wrong, old buddy. I definitely do have my fair share of getting yelled at by the Hero Commission, but what can you do? Our mission is for the greater good, after all. Saying that being a hero, while he does like it, it's not exactly the best thing in the world, seeing as all of his actions have to be dictated by the Hero Commission. And by the way, guys, in case you guys hear my chair squeaking a little bit in the video, I do apologize for that, but I can't really help it. The chair just likes to squeak sometimes. That said, this is when he would proceed to ask Deku a question, saying that for the real reason that he wanted to talk to him and catch up, saying that he needs help for a mission, saying that if he'll help him, he'll help him out with his own mission, saying that all the time that he isn't in school, he could help him infiltrate the Liberation Army, asking, are you in or are you out? With Deku saying, this is even a question, I'm in. He would smile, and from here, a smile would come across the face of Hawks as he would begin to explain in detail what everything about the mission consists of and why he has to do it. From here, Deku would begin abruptly scouting the place and familiarizing himself with the Liberation Army and their ideals, how they operate, and changing his appearance any time that he goes near the area with Hawks who at this point is trying to involve himself with the League of Villains and has Deku involve himself personally with the Liberation Army as just some random kid who was just wanting their, who, you know, just agrees with their ideals. And so, for the next couple of weeks, Deku will be fulfilling tasks for them, trying to prove himself as Hawks would actually get more and more intel on the League of Villains. And this is all going on while the UA Finals are happening. And since the finals are unremarkable, I'm just going to breeze through them. Deku would not really study with any of his friends, seeing as during this time, he would be helping Hawks out with his things. And so, we're just going to be skipping straight to the day. So, 
Deku passes the written part, obviously, and he actually ends up end up ending up having to fight against Aizawa alongside Momo Yayarozu. And so the battle commences with me having to be the one to make up the battle. But it's actually kind of an interesting one. Keep in mind, Aizawa is going to be having to wear some weighted stuff just to make sure that he isn't sh not as strong, just kind of held back. But Deku, upon hearing that Aizawa is going to be limiting himself to not his best, would say, oh, that's not necessary. You can take those restraints off. You're going to need to take them off for me. As Aizawa would scoff and say that he just made a big choice, not to blame him for him failing. Deku would say that he's not going to fail. With Momo at his side, at his side, he'll be just fine. Aizawa would proceed to nod as from here, the battle would begin. And Aizawa would start off by pretty much scouting the area, trying to find where Deku and Momo are located. Deku would pretty much end up telling Momo to create a bow staff for him, as she would do so, and Deku would end up grabbing it, spinning it in his hands, as he would say, do you know how to use this at all? Momo would say, no, but you could teach me. And from here, Deku would spend the next minute or so trying to teach her the basic movements of a bow staff, with Momo being utterly confused, and Deku saying, that, you know, how come she doesn't know how to use it? He saw her using it earlier on. And Momo would get right in the face and she would say, I'm sorry, I, I just wanted you to, you know, spend some time with me. And Deku would just have a chuckle, like just smile with like a smirk, I guess you could say, as he moves the hair out of his face and says, I don't blame you, but let's get back to the mission. As Momo would just have a red, completely tomato-like face. As from here, Deku would tell Momo that she's going to be in charge of pretty much just going to the area uh going to an area where she can actually catch aizawa off guard seeing as he could handle the whole thing by himself but he wants to make momo feel included seeing as this is a chance for her to get over her under under confidence like her self-esteem issues when it comes to her and being able to do the pro hero actions that are necessary and so that's pretty much what ends up going down so what happens is i see aizawa jumping in from the top of roofs as Deku looks at Aizawa who lands right in front of him and Deku would smirk with Aizawa shooting his scarf right at the hand of Deku who then shoots him out into a wall. Seeing this, Momo would want to jump out but Deku would look at her and give her this look of keep in the plan, like stay to the, keep, stick to the plan, you know what I mean? Momo would do so and Deku would get up as he cracks his knuckles and his neck and then rushes in at Aizawa as he catches the scarf and drags Aizawa in, punching Aizawa square in the face as it causes Aizawa to have his vision get blurred just for a second for Deku to sweep the leg and drag Aizawa onto the ground. Aizawa would then go on to put Deku in an arm lock as Deku pretty much ends up having to use his arm shrink to pick Aizawa up with Aizawa gripping onto his arm in a lock as he smashes Aizawa into a wall and Momo then comes in with a with a taser gun as she shoots the back of Aizawa who feels the damage but ends up ripping it out of himself saying that that's not nearly enough to beat him. He would end up activating his quirk cancellation ability and he would actually take away the entire ability from Momo to even use her quirk. Deku would toss her his staff as he would say that she's going to be needing it. And Momo would then proceed to rush in as she begins to try to fight Aizawa with Deku. And so what ends up happening after this is that both Deku and Momo actually end up doing a pretty good job. And they actually establish themselves as having some pretty solid teamwork. Deku was there to guide her actions. And with Momo kind of just being there, somebody to like just just just, just with Deku just kind of giving her her own little moment. Once that's pretty much over, Deku would jump in and promptly go on to defeat Aizawa in hand-to-hand -hand combat, with everybody being extremely shocked at this, but Deku saying that what did they expect? Aizawa's main target is fighting against quirk people who are not exactly the best when it comes to fighting hand-to-hand, -hand because, you know, most people nowadays rely on quirks, but when he has to fight against somebody who doesn't have a quirk and just fights hand-to-hand, -hand, Aizawa is fighting a uphill battle, saying that Aizawa's skills are pretty much second to none, other than him and from here he would smirk with Aizawa thinking to himself that that kid has a ton of potential throwing a scarf at Deku's direction and asking if he would like to learn it but Deku would simply grab the scarf and throw it at Aizawa's direction as he grabs him by the arm and yanks him towards him saying I already do as from here he walks away with everybody watching him leave in such a badass fashion 
And from here, what I believe would end up happening is Deku would just go on to continue trying to involve himself with the Liberation Army, with all of them being told about the training cramp camp and having permission slips given out to each and every single one of them. Everybody would have to go home to their families as, you know, from here, everybody just kind of ends up having to, you know, do their thing. And from here, Uraka would actually suggest Deku to go out to the mall. Deku would end up asking everybody else and it would turn into a giant group thing where all of UA pretty much ends up wanting to go to the mall. And by UA, I mean class 1A. So yeah, the day would eventually arrive and Deku would just throw in a hoodie, some jeans and some forces, some basic drip, but it works. And so he ends up making his way towards the mall where Uraraka and Momo are eagerly awaiting his arrival. Once he does end up arriving there, they all end up going store to store shopping with the girls trying on a bunch of dresses and Momo buying a bunch of things for herself and the other girls trying to kind of show Deku, look, I have a lot of money. <laughs> but, you know, eventually they all end up making their way towards the food court, going to what's a really basic food court that almost every place has going to like a Panda Express or something like that. And, you know, they end up grubbing. And from here, they all have a good time. After this, I think it's a cool thing to say that they would all definitely end up making their way towards an arcade, having a ton of fun in the process, and Deku would end up winning so many jackpots as he ends up getting a giant teddy bear. And when it comes to the teddy bear, he doesn't actually end up giving it to anybody because he knows that if he was to give one to Momo, Uraka gets jealous. Or Uraka would get jealous if he gives it to... I mean, I mean, vice versa. You guys know what I mean. So he just keeps it for himself, and it's like a giant, like, pig, basically. It's like a giant pig plushie. And so he just tosses it on his bed when he gets home and calls it a day. He passes out and tunes into another one of Zether's videos with him watching a new segment of the video being like, Zether has memberships? What? I'm gonna join. He clicks on the button and sees a bunch of perks, which I'm not even gonna say are up on screen because I'm too lazy to edit that in there. But as I said... There are channel memberships now, and what do these memberships offer? It's pretty simple. You basically just get early access to these videos. Like, if you're watching this now, this, the next part of this series is already up there, and I'm pretty sure, knowing myself, the next two parts after this are even up there as well, just because I've been pumping out videos like crazy, seeing as it is the summer, and I have a lot of time to work with. So if you're a member, or you choose to become a member, the summer is the best time, because you're going to be getting early access to tons of videos before that anybody else gets to, and also you're going to be getting priority reply and comments there's also a second stage but i honestly forgot what perks i made um but yeah if you have the money for it and you want to get early access to the videos and i i'd say you might as well join i mean you have nothing to lose other than your money and uh i want that so run me them pockets <laughs> oh my god I'm, I'm i'm being serious like 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 that's what i'm here for boys this is this is my job this is my job <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm just playing. If you don't have the funds for it, it doesn't matter. Just keep watching the videos, keep liking them, keep commenting, and that's the best way to show your support. That said, let's get back into the what if. Eventually, the day would come when everybody would end up being kind of told about the, um, what's it called? Everybody would end up being told about the forest and everybody would hop on into the bus as the group ends up having a pretty fun time. They're all playing road trip games and they finally end up arriving to the said location where once they get off, they see the training camp about three, three hours walking distance away. And they're like, uh, why did we stop here? But Deku knows all too well. And from here, Mandalay would go on to throw the entire Class 1A off of the edge saying, Good luck, kids! As all of them fall, and they're like, No! You know, they tried getting back in the bus, but what could they do at that point? Their fate was sealed. That said, though, what ends up happening following that would be... Mm, what should happen? Yeah, they pretty much end up going through the, uh, the monster segment, just bulldozing through everything. And seeing as Deku doesn't have one for all, he ends up, you know, just using his uh, his weapon, Diamond, to help him out with taking up a couple of those monsters. It would take them a little bit longer, seeing as all for one definitely, I mean, one for all was definitely a huge help in that part. So I'm estimating another 10 minutes, but regardless, once they pass, they end up being treated to cooking by Mandalay, who says that they better eat and rest, because this is going to be one of the last days that they finally get to eat. Uh, eat a good meal, seeing as they're going to be cooking for themselves for the next days to come. Deku would end up going to grub, and the whole time he's eating, he would notice Todoroki staring at bullet, bullets at him. 
Jackie would look at Todoroki and say, got a problem? And Todoroki would just not say anything, saying that there was quite some disrespect that he showed him in that sports festival. He didn't take him for that kind of person. With Deku saying that you can't assume anything about anybody. Saying that he pretty much sealed his fate the second that he wanted to talk to him all tough. And from here, Deku would say to not get too ahead of himself, saying that he's already winning the hearts of all the classmates. That soon enough, he'll be just a second thought. He'll be known as nothing but Endeavor's son. And Deku is like this towards Todoroki just because from the beginning Todoroki like didn't like Deku and Deku just hasn't liked Todoroki back. They kind of have this unspoken rivalry and hatred for each other. But I digress. That said, what ends up happening next is the group just rests and for the following couple of days they would just end up having a period of time where all of them were working on their quirks for one entire day until eventually Class 1B would arrive. And seeing this perfect opportunity to actually spy on Class 1B, Deku would take this time to pretty much try to infiltrate Class 1B and make up a bunch of friends with them, trying to get closer and closer to anybody who he could deem anything potentially seeming like the traitor. One thing that Deku definitely would do during this time is keep a very close eye on Invisible Girl and Aoyama, seeing as he already has heavy suspicions on the both of them. And so, with this, Deku pretty much just ends up doing investigation and spy work. And if you guys haven't seen the series Spy X or the manga, I definitely recommend checking it out if you like anything related to spies. Speaking of spies, have you guys seen Spy Kids? Let me know down below in the comments. I really want to know. That was like one of my favorite movies growing up. So I just want to know if anybody else feels that way. And personally, I like Spy Kids 3, where they enter the game world and they had all these cool robot suits. As a kid, it looked so awesome, but it didn't really hold up as well once I watched it as an adult, basically. So just let me know what you guys think. That said, using this time, he would actually end up getting a couple of suspicions on a couple of Class 1B students, but nothing as serious as the suspicions that he had for Aoyama and Invisible Girl. And so he would end up focusing his training with Aizawa, as well as the male member of the Wild Wild Pussycats, fighting him over and over and over to increase his, uh, his fighting combat skills. However, Deku had to heavily hold back to make it seem as if you know, that guy was stronger than him. Even though if Deku was to truly try, he could put him down in 10 seconds flat. Yeah, that's how broken this man Deku is. He hasn't been training all his life for no reason. Deku definitely has gotten a lot of power from that. And with that said, he would actually end up uh, pretty much having a pretty good time with the training overall. And inevitably, the day would come when they're all playing hide and go seek in the nighttime and Deku would just follow Koda to bring him a curry bowl. When suddenly, he spots a gigantic muscular man. And this would be the villain known as muscular as he would say. <laughs> Looks like I got lucky tonight. What did this man just say? From here, Deku would look up as he would see Muscular in his giant muscular form already. As Deku sees this, he would go to grab one of his weapons, but notice he doesn't have a suit on or any of his weapons on. And so he would look towards Koda, who at this point is pretty much frozen in fear. And Deku would look back up at Muscular as he would just be thinking, this man's sus, but I'm not about to beat this dude. Look at him. He has muscles on his muscles. And so... Deku pretty much looks to the side of the cliff and thinks to himself that he needs to get out of here. And so what he would do is tell Koda, Koda, use your quirk, shoot him now. And so Koda would shoot his water blaster. No, actually, Koda would not be able to do anything. Koda would literally just sit there too scared to move. And Deku would jump in as he grabs Koda out of getting crushed by Muscular's fist. And from here, he throws him on his back as he begins running down the mountain as fast as he possibly can, with Muscular chasing after him every step of the way, Deku trying his absolute hardest not to get hit or hurt Koda whatsoever. And eventually, as soon as Muscular's fist was actually about to come down on Deku on one of the sharp turns, Deku would think to himself that this is it. This dude is legit about to kill him. Like Deku, yeah, he has all this cool tactics, but it's not gonna work against somebody like that. Deku understands his limits. Without weapons, he's not about to beat somebody with a quirk like this, a physical brawler type. And so Deku's about to get crushed by the fist when Koda says, get away, and he shoots him. He says, you killed my parents. And Muscular has to cover his face and eye as 
you know, he pretty much gets uh, thrown off guard for a second. Just long enough for Deku to run down the rest of the mountain. Not all of it, but, you know, get a couple second head start. And then from there, rush to where, where Aizawa was at as he just finished defeating the Dabi twice clone. And so once that happens, Deku would look towards Aizawa as he says, use your eraser quirk now. And eraser head would immediately activate it as he looks towards the direction of the forest and muscular comes running out, guns blazing with his muscles huge. And suddenly they go away. Uh, eraser head's quirk ends up working and it actually ends up catching him off guard. And so from here, what Deku ends up doing is essentially just leaving Koda there with him and telling Aizawa that he's going to handle the rest. He has other things to take care of. And so from here, he would run off as Aizawa is simply forced to say, hey, kid, come back. But Deku wouldn't listen. He would simply run off and Aizawa would just scoff as he would have to fight against Muscular. He would end up defeating him since Muscular relies too much on his quirk. And I don't believe that he has any physical like I don't think he could beat Aizawa in a one hand to hand combat fight. So Aizawa ends up clapping man's cheeks and says, looks like I got lucky tonight myself. <laughs> no, I'm totally kidding. But seriously, though, Aizawa would end up defeating Muscular. And so from here, Deku would actually end up running in to the place as he would end up grabbing his hero suit as well as his weapons telling Aizawa that that he needed to get this stuff as he walks outside to see the big lug on the ground just completely passed out and so Aizawa would look at Deku's direction as he would say I need to go save the other students and from here he would rush straight into the forest with one goal in mind find the traitor that's all Deku was thinking at this moment just find the traitor if anything is clear on this night, it's that the traitor definitely has to be within either the teachers that are present here or class 1A or 1B. So Deku, realizing this, would rush straight into the forest trying to find if the traitor is going to reveal himself on this night. And when he would run into the forest, he wouldn't end up running into Tokiyami or Dupli Arms or any of those things and instead he would end up running into a scene of Dabi almost about to close in on Aoyama, who was holding his breath and hiding behind some bushes. Deku would see this from afar as he would hide behind a tree with his back against it, thinking to himself that this is it. He's about to find out if Aoyama is the traitor. If he ends up touching him or looking at him, he'll have his answer. But nothing. It's as if Dobby saw who was behind there and simply walked away acting as if he didn't notice. But one thing Deku would have done with his deductive reasoning skills is notice. He noticed what happened. Dabi clearly caught sight of Aoyama, who covered his mouth and pretended to act as if he didn't notice him. And from here, Dabi simply left the area. After Dabi was gone, Deku jumped in and he actually ended up grabbing Aoyama by the shirt saying, it's you, isn't it? You're the traitor. And Aoyama would look at him and say, what? What are, what are you talking about? But Deku would say it's clear as day. He clearly looked at you and walked away. There's a reason for that. You're the mole, aren't you? That secret spot that you went to in the USJ, that was you telling the villains where we were, wasn't it? You're the traitor. You're the mole. Someone had to tell them about where we're going, and the only people that were informed was class 1B, A, and the teachers alike. So it has to be either you or an invisible girl. I ended up tracking you down, and now you're going to pay for what you did. As he just looks at Aoyama, who at this point starts tearing up, saying that he's sorry, and he would shoot his laser beam right at Deku's direction. But Deku would get blasted back as he falls onto the ground and then picks himself right back up, telling Aoyama that he's not going to get away. He points his gun straight at Aoyama's legs as he lets it rip and the bullets would go straight through his feet, causing Aoyama not to be able to run anymore. Deku would rush towards Aoyama as he would kick him into a tree and then proceed to pound on his head as Aoyama just is laying down on the ground in the fetal position, saying that he doesn't understand. He had no choice, but Deku would say to save it for the judge as he then knocks him out with a kick to the head and from here he would call upon the hero commission who at this point would end up showing up and helping with the taking out of the rest of the villains and also reconnaissance and things such as that that said this is when they would proceed to drain all of the information possible that they could out of aoyama and from here he would pretty much end up being taken away by the hero commission themselves as the following day, Deku would be congratulated for completing his mission in record time. 
the hero commission would inform him that since he passed this mission he's going to be going on many others and he's going to be promoted in terms of like the amount of asset that he had that he is to the uh hero commission and so Deku would nod bow down and leave the room as from here it would be announced that Deku is leaving UA. His resignation papers would come in and Deku would never go back to the high school, ever telling them what had happened that day, since it's no longer his problem. Of course he would miss it, but what could he do? He can't change the way that things are, for now. And so, I'm just going to be covering the brief changes that happened to the story. Number one, Dupli Arms gets heavily injured by Tokiyami's quirk, and once Tokiyami's about to kill him, he finally is able to restrain himself as he has to be in the hospital for months and with Deku resigning from UA once all was said and done he never actually ends up finding out about the fact that Bakugo was actually taken by the villains because that ended up staying constant Tokiyami he was not and Deku like I said after reporting to the hero commission this was not really briefed on any of the things that happened after him completing his mission and so he never finds out about Bakugo being taken so that never turns out to be one of his concerns that said it that's really the only changes that happened. I mean, other than Aizawa fighting against Muscular and him being the one to take him out, nothing else really changes too much in the story. So, I'm going to be continuing on with Deku being summoned by the Hero Commission the very next day. They would have his next mission set out for him. The Hero Commission would have ended up finding out about All Might's uh, situation, not in terms of All for One and his, uh, his secret of, you know, being a successor, but in terms of the sting operation to get Bakugo back, UA school would have been in complete shambles with the media, seeing as they right now are going through what they would have done in the original, trying to have parents accept the students to go back with dorms and stuff like that, and that whole system would begin to be implemented in UA High. However, simultaneously, the heroes would have been planning a break-in to pretty much save Katsuki Bakugo, with Aizawa stating in the media that Katsuki, he's too hard-headed to be brought into with the villains or be changed that he'll be brought back soon enough and that you know they could count on it and so from here deku would actually be reported to um in terms of what finally happened now with the hero commission tasking him with a brand new mission this one to kill all for one and from here deku's eyes would widen thinking to himself what i couldn't possibly but the hero commission would hold one hand out and say that he needs to wait just a second before he gives his answer keep in mind he has no choice in the matter they would walk out with a giant sniper rifle as they would hold it up to deku and tell him that this this weapon here is the most powerful sniper rifle in the world and it's 100 percent silent if he shoots it at all for one at just the right moment there's a chance he could kill him without even having to fight all for one all he needs is the hero's distraction, and with Deku's precise aim, he should definitely be able to get the job done. He's going to be located on top of a tower, my, uh, like a lot, like miles away from the area. And Deku would nod, saying that he'll do his best. The hero commission saying that they hope so, because his life is on the line. And so, the operation would go down just like in canon, with All Might saying, Pizza's here, and then busting through the wall with all of the heroes and, you know, pretty much taking out the League of Villains. And so, once this happens, All For One teleports his goons away, with Bakugo running out right in the nick of the moment, not actually being saved by Class 1A, but him just literally leaving, finding the first moment to escape and taking it, and All Might's fight against All For One would begin, with it going exactly as it does in the original, seeing as Deku isn't exactly personally involved. That said, what ends up happening from here is basically all for one would go on to tell all might about shigaraki's involvement with the league and him being nana shimura's grandson talking up a speech monologuing standing still for just the right shot for luna or deku or agent nine he would be briefed in by his comms as he would say i have a shot i'm taking it from here he would aim his weapon as he would shoot the shoot the trigger and from here the bullet would fly miles away as it would penetrate through the skull of all for one and he would fall straight to the ground with all might watching in complete disbelief as the man that he had been chasing almost half of his life die in front of his eyes he would fall to his knees and then his body would go cold and limp all for one was defeated all might would then abruptly go on to stand up and say 
I did it, as he holds his fist up into the air and proceeds to stand atop of everything, with the media simply saying that it was All Might who defeated him with, uh, you know, a special attack that, you know, it ended up working or something like that. And the media just kind of runs away with that story, and that's kind of the cover up for All for One's death. And so what ends up happening from here is as soon as Deku finds out that he did it, he is shocked. I mean, in a society with heroes and quirks and stuff like that, there's never been need for guns. But now Deku understands just how potent, how powerful, how much guns are still a huge thing in this society. With a gun, anybody could truly be killed, even All Might. A bullet like that with All Might's guard down could have completed that job as well. And so, Deku would now be more weary about weaponry and stuff like that. And so... The student of Katsuki Bakugo would be taken back to the heroes, where he would end up going back into class 1A, and from here, Deku would end up catching the attention of a bunch of people, who were all wondering what happened to him, but people would just assume that he was one of the people who ended up leaving. The media would go crazy with that story saying that the one quirkless kid who was once part of class 1A and the winner of the sports festival ended up leaving Yue after the events of the, uh, the uh, forced training arc. And so the media just ends up having a pretty like down day with a bunch of quirkless people saying that, you know, that's too bad. But Deku, seeing as he's not even in UA anymore, doesn't look the way that the thumbnail does. Now Deku has a different look. Now he actually has his green hair, his green eyes. And Deku has one thing on his mind. He wants to go see his mother. And so he asks Hawks, you know that favor I asked you for? Help me do it now. Hawks, I want to see my mom. Hawks would look at Deku as he would say, your, your, your parents? And Deku would say, yeah, I mean, I've missed them. I, I just want to know if they're okay. That's all I want. I just want to see them from afar. That's it. Hawks would look to him as he would say, I mean, I guess it's an easy task to do then. Let's get it done. As he would pat him on the back, telling him that he's still such a softy and that even though he has become more of a hard ass now, he's still the same kid deep down. Deku saying, how couldn't he be? His childhood was stripped from him by this evil hero commission. And even though this ended up doing more good than bad for the world, with All for One finally being taken care of and the mole in UA being outed, all Hawks has to do now is pretty much take down the League of Villains. And that's the question that Hawks was going to be getting down to asking Deku pretty soon. Will he help him with a takedown of the League of Villains remaining seven members? And after that, the rest of the League will disband once the next couple of leaders or the top men are dis you know, disposed of. And so... Deku and Hawks would pretty much end up doing a little bit of undercover research with Hawks actually telling Deku that there's usually one day where the Hero Commission doesn't put too much attention onto them and that's the day that they could take this opportunity to. They would be like uh, like daytime, they usually don't pay too much attention to them in daytime and also on a specific day. And so he would take this opportunity to actually go to his old living house where it was just an apartment. Deku would watch as he sees Zinko walk into the house with Hisashi, a smile on all of their faces, and a small little girl, his sister. He wouldn't know the name, but he would just see the green hair. She looks so much like Inko. A smile would appear on Deku's face as he would say, I'm glad you moved on, mom. I don't know what they told you, but I'm just glad you're happy here. And I'm glad that I was able to finally, I guess you could say, become well, kind of a hero. He would think to himself and think back to all of the dreams that he had as a little kid when he wanted to be just like All Might and now having the opportunity to meet him, it was as if that all was stripped away from him. Him believing that All Might would come to save him one day never happened. And so Deku's hero aspirations and um, kind of over hype of All Might dies down along with Deku's hopes to be saved someday. It never happened and so Deku believes things to be different than what he originally had. And so Deku was about to leave, but he just he just wanted to say one thing to his mom, that he was still there, that he missed her and that he loved her. And so Deku would decide to knock on the door. And when he would do so, he would simply just look at Inko in the eyes as she drops everything that she had in her hand and says, Izuku? Hey mom, it's 
It's been a while, Izuku would say as he rubs the back of his head and looks to the doorway. As Izuku, or I'm sorry, not Izuku, but Inko sheds tears. She immediately would begin crying loudly as she hugs onto Deku and says, Honey, I, I, I thought you died. I, I saw your, I saw your body cold. L Lim, how are you? But Deku would tell her that it's nothing important for now, but just know that He's here and safe. As suddenly, from the background, Deku would see as a girl that looks so much like Inko would walk to the doorway and she would stare at Izuku who looks so much like her. And she would say, Mama? Who's at the door? Suddenly, Izuku would look at her direction as Inko would say, uh, Don't worry about it, sweetie. It's just your big brother. And she would look towards him and she says, I have a brother? Inko would then remind her about how, you know, she had a older brother that died a long time ago and she would say oh that's right but mommy how is he here if he's dead and inko would say i don't know sweetie but just be glad he's here she would go to embrace deku as a single tear would come down his cheek and he would hold his hand out saying no it's i can't i couldn't possibly as from here his little sister goes over to hug his leg and says i don't know what's going on but i'm happy you're here and from here Izuku would just hug his mother tightly as Hiyashi just comes in and says, Honey, what's going? As he sees his son and says, Izuku, what are you? And he would just be quiet as he comes in and embraces his child, looking older, jaded, and so much different than what he could have remembered. He never pictured his son would have turned out that way. Deku would simply go to look at Inko as he says, Mom, it's a long story, but honestly... I don't know if I'll ever be able to tell you it, but on the off chance that I might, just know I'm okay now. And just know that I'm kind of fulfilling my dream to be a pro hero now that, you know, as well as things go, that maybe someday he'll get to actually have a day out with them. Maybe go on a cruise or something. And Inko would just uncontrollably sob as she says, Izuku, don't go. But Deku would look at her as he would say, I'm sorry, mom, but... I'm putting the family at risk by simply showing myself. Just know you're, I'm safe and that I'll see you someday. Bye, Mom. The family is all in tears, except for Ikari, his younger sister, who would simply look out the window and wave her older brother by, saying, Bye now! As from here, Izuku would leave, and he would see hawks on the top of a roof as he would say, That was some family reunion. You did put on quite a spectacle there, Izuku. As from here... Deku would say, I guess, as he would proceed to say he's just thankful he got to see his mom one last time, telling him that he's just grateful for the opportunity. After this, once they're on the roof, Hawks would tell Izuku that the day is approaching for them to finally get rid of the League of Villains and totally annihilate them. And so, Hawks would look to Deku with him telling him that he can't do it alone, he's gonna need an extra pair of hands, with Deku saying that he's down and that he'll be ready whenever that day comes. A week would pass, and so they would end up creating a plan, with Deku and Hawks both getting ready. Deku would land on the top of the roof and would pretty much end up penetrating the base through the air vents, as Hawks would end up walking in with his usual demeanor, walking to the group asking them how things have been and how they're holding up without all for one, with Shigaraki saying, how do you think? He ends up leaving the room, and from here, this is when, you know, Hawks would simply look towards the direction of, of twice as he takes out a, a gun and shoots twice straight in the head, causing him to shift into this sludge-like material on the ground, which just falls limp. And from here, Dobby, Toga, and all of the villains, pre villains present would simply, oh, actually, no, Toga's not even there, I forgot. Dobby and a bunch of extra villains would simply be watching as they're like, what? However, suddenly, Deku would drop from the air vents, kicking Dobby away, as Dobby had to take a couple of seconds to kind of catch his, you know, his, his surroundings way better. And from here, Deku would run towards the area where they have their electric generator, as Deku would begin to pretty much frantically start hacking into it and pretty much busting it so that the lights would immediately be turned off. However, just before doing that, he would toss a pair of goggles to Hawks' direction that have night vision as he 
and the Hawks would both proceed to s immediately start taking down multiple League of Villains members. As from here, Dobby would simply see flashes of Deku and the Hawks as he's using his fire for lights. And every time that he that, that he lights his flames, he would just see Deku and, and Hawks getting closer and closer with Dobby thinking to himself, no, 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 how is this happening? As he watches all of the villains fall in rapid succession. Dobby would begin freaking out as they would approach closer and closer, using his flames to blast cremation down the hallway, roasting whoever was alive, like other villains and stuff like that, leaving his comrades to die, similar to how Endeavor left him to die when he was a child. And so, Deku and Hawks would appear from above as they take him down with Hawks using one of his feathers to slash at Dobby's throat, leaving him for dead, completing the mission, killing off all loose ends, or so they think. Until Shigaraki would jump in and jump onto Deku as he grabs him with four fingers on his throat and says, step back or I'll kill the brat. As from here, Shigaraki would hold it up to Deku's neck and Hawks would simply just look at Deku as he would say, kill him and Shigaraki. It doesn't matter. Use the gun, blast the hole straight through both of their heads if he has to. As from here, Hawks would just watch as Deku would say, don't worry about me. Just kill that bastard as he would smile and then proceed to use this loose hand that he has to grab at Shigaraki's face, shocking him with the spy tool that he uses, destroying Shigaraki's face, pretty much melting it with electricity. As Deku would see as Shigaraki would fall onto the ground, he would take his gun as he would shoot it at the head of Shigaraki saying, good riddance. After the death of Shigaraki, and the immediate takedown of the League of Villains, many of them would break up from the overall League of Villains, reorganizing with a small fry, uh, like new up and coming leader. This person being Dr. Doofenshmirtz, or <laughs> the leader of the Liberation Army, Destructo. And so, Hawks at this moment, alongside Deku, would both actually, once the mission was all said and done, would actually end up being incarcerated for disobeying the Public Safety Commission and taking out the League of Villains without orders, saying that this was the last straw for Hawks, and as for Deku, if they let him go around doing the things that he's been up to, then they're not going to be giving him an example, saying he'll be locked up for a couple of months, but Hawks, he'll be taken out indefinitely. He doesn't listen to them anymore and he's become more of a wild card as the time goes on. Deku and Hawks would both be shocked and imprisoned shortly after. During this time, the Public Hero Commission would actually end up having a, a meetup, a secret one at that, with the Yakuza members, seeing as they wish to acquire both the Quirk Enhancers and the Anti-Quirk Technology in exchange for funding and government cover-up of Yakuza's activities. And during this time, they would end up aligning themselves with the Yakuza and overhaul as a whole. With Deku and Hawks having to get rid, uh, used to their prison life, being inserted straight in a Tartarus. As Deku and Hawks would end up spending the next couple of weeks as, you know, overhauling them, simply go on with their activities unknown. Ares' torture would continue as the anti-quirk bullets would be, you know, made way more powerful. And the Safety Hero Commission would actually end up using these enhancement quirks to use on all of the kids that they take from a young age and begin to make them way more powerful, making them subjugated to more and more powerful drugs to make their quirks more powerful and make their training regimens harder inevitably resulting in more powerful soldiers for them to use in the long run. That said, this is when, you know, Izuku and Hawks would both end up pretty much being like, what do we do? And they have no real out. They want to get out. So they would end up pretty much trying to plan things out. With during this all happening, the Yakuza actually betraying the Hero Commission, taking over and placing a puppet leader at the head of the Hero Commission, using one of Overhaul's generals who has the ability to merge things, merging with the old leader's body and taking over the Hero Commission as it stands. While Deku and Hawks are planning their break out of Tartarus, with Deku using his knowledge that he would have learned from the White Room to hypnotize and make the guards open his cage without even using a quirk. Deku would then grab one of the guards tasers as he hits him right in the neck and causes the guard to be knocked out instantly. 
From here, he would end up stealing the guard's uniform and would break Hawks out of the jail cell after going around to each and every level and trying to essentially find out as much um, information that he could about the building and pretty much ending up using uh, the information that other villains had and breaking them out as well to actually get out of their situation, breaking out a certain person by the name of Lady Nagan, who was actually in the prison and she would end up helping Deku and Hawks both escape. As from here, they actually end up deciding to investigate what's been happening in the outside world, finding out that the Hero Commission was actually taken over of. And considering that they were incarcerated for a while, they try to end up catching up on normal media, with Deku and Hawks realizing that the weapon known as Diamond had been taken over using their personal trackers that the Yakuza had not discovered yet. As Deku and Hawks and Lady Nagant, who would actually end up joining them, would actually end up deciding that they need to infiltrate the Yakuza headquarters and make it so that they could take down the Hero Commission as it stands. Because now, it's not only an illegal organization, but now they're infiltrated with villains and a bunch of different things that could go wrong. So Deku and Hawks, it's up to them, as well as Lady Nagant, who is simply going to be there as kind of backup. As it's their job and theirs alone to save the Hero Commission and disband it as a whole. This society, this system needs to be broken from the ground up and rebuilt. And only Deku and Hawks could be the only two to possibly get this done. So now, as things stand, they would end up infiltrating Yakuza headquarters, running into it, and for the following weeks, pretty much incorporating themselves into its system. With them not finding out anything about the quirk destroying bullets or anything about that stuff however they would end up learning about one thing overhaul having a daughter one of the guards would actually end up over you know pretty much talking about this and deku would have actually overheard this thinking to himself that overhaul must be the leader and if he can get uh get um get hostage of his daughter he could potentially be able to trade her life for his glove back that way they could potentially stand more of a chance against all overhaul and so this would pretty much be the plan for weeks on end they would decide to pretty much continue with the infiltration of the yakuza and the overhaul as deku would put on another one of his disguises and simply use some pieces of technology to pretty much add more gadgets to his spy suit a bunch more things that he's actually able to use to plant bugs on people and overhear conversations as well as slowly beginning to complete more and more tasks for the Yakuza family to get on the good side of overhaul until eventually the day would come where he would be in charge of taking care of Aerie for one night. However, after seeing the treacherous torture that they that they do on her, Deku would feel awful thinking back to his time in the white room where he was trained alongside Hawks thinking to himself that he's going to feel awful for what he's about to have to do but maybe he can explain things to Aria and tell her that he's really here to help, then maybe she won't be as scared. But he's not sure because maybe things won't be sold as well. And so, Deku would decide to simply tell her once all was said and done. And so, the plan would be put into action. Deku would end up taking Aerie, and as soon as Overhaul was to find out, he would bust into the room with Deku telling him that he wants his glove in exchange for her life, with him having a gun held to Aerie's head, saying that if anybody is to come close or try anything funny, he'll blast her brains into oblivion. Overhaul, not wanting to lose his sole reason for coming into power, would decide to give him the glove, saying that it's no big deal to just hand Aerie back. And so, it's at this moment that Deku put, put the glove on and then look at Arius. He would say, I'm sorry I have to do this, but I'm here to save you. Don't worry. I'll come back for you. As from here, Deku would proceed to toss Aerie towards the direction of Overhaul as he would turn on his locator that Hawks would end up actually tracking as Hawks would bust into the room with Overhaul and Deku both looking at the direction of Overhaul as he ends up getting caught off guard with Overhaul deciding that fine if that's how they want to play it as he would aim the quirk destroying bullet at Deku's direction saying so be it then I'm getting rid of your quirk as a whole blasting the bullet straight at Deku's direction but Deku would get shot with it as the bullet would pop off of his body and he would say, Joke's on you, but I don't have a quirk. And from here, he would hold the quirk destroying bullet with his grub, assimilating it with its nanotechnology. As Deku would say, Quirk destroying glove, huh? Interesting. 
it's going to be pretty useful in the long run as he opens and crushes his hand over and over thinking to himself i can feel the power he would end up creating the glove to turn into a full metal arm as Hawks would lunge at Overhaul's direction and throw a bunch of feathers at him to keep him at bay. Overhaul would begin using a bunch of spikes in the ground to try to make Hawks dodge into the air, weaving and doing these different maneuvers to glide around the spikes that are appearing from the ground. However, eventually Hawks would be put on the back foot and it's at this moment that Deku would actually end up using his training that he would have learned from the white room dodging each and every single attack that's coming after him closing his eyes taking an extreme breath thinking to himself we've every movement that he's making is calculated and Deku is putting all of the training he's he's gathered throughout his years of being alive to use his deductive reasoning skills helping him with this in the process as Deku would then proceed to pretty much get closer and closer to overhaul as he would actually shoot um, a sort of taser from the glove itself that would actually end up catching overhaul off guard just long enough for Deku to actually stun overhaul. However, it's at this moment that overhaul would actually shoot a pillar straight into Hawks's leg, which would catch him off guard heavily. And right before overhaul was about to stab another one right into Hawks, killing him, Deku would jump in the way and grab him with his glove, causing overhaul's quirk to be deactivated and letting Hawks escape just long enough for Hawks to come in and using his feathers would actually cut straight into Overhaul's head, causing the head of Overhaul to roll on the ground as Aerie would scream and a bunch of the villains would actually have heard the crazy commotion that was going on. However, with this being the case, Deku would turn towards Aerie as he would say, get on now. And from here, they would begin rushing through the building as they begin trying to take out as many people as they possibly could left and right with Lady Nagant clearing the path as she begins to kill people at the entrance, just going off with her weapons as she uses her quirk. And in case you guys don't know who Lady Nagant is, look her up. She is a total badass. By the way, after you look her up, if you had uh, don't know who she is and uh, you haven't seen my what if Deku with Lady Nagant's quirk go check that out too but uh self plugging out of the way he would pretty much proceed to jump in and essentially uh what's it called um like like run through the place and everything is going good until they end up coming face to face with one of the villains known as Kendo Rappa however Deku using this glove and Kendo not knowing that he actually has the ability to take quirks away would hold on to him long enough for his quirk to be deactivated and for Lady Nagant to get a perfect shot on his head as Deku begins to dodge and move out of the way with Lady Nagant's precision being so accurate that it misses Deku by a hair and hits Kendo Rappa straight in the brain causing his body to fall limp on the ground as they begin decimating the entire operation and Hawks would then take out a button as as soon as they're outside he would press it and the entire hero commission building as well as Yakuza new hideout headquarters would be destroyed in the process and they would be outside with the flames erupting with Deku, Hawks and Lady Nagant standing victorious having defeated the newly hero commission taken over by Overhaul and the Yakuza family with this being one of their greatest accomplishments that they've ever had. Shortly after the authorities would arrive and Deku would actually end up giving out his real name as well as the information of the fact that of everything that's been going on. And afterwards, he would end up actually going to a hero that he knows he could definitely trust. All Might. He and Hawks would arrive in front of All Might's house as he would end up telling All Might the entire situation, with Deku and Hawks being thrown into custody once more as well as Lady and Gaunt. But after All Might is able to clear everything with the press and the media and let all this information be leaked out about how corrupted the Hero Commission truly was, Hero Society would drop in terms of like popularity and a bunch of people would stop wanting to become heroes. However, all Might would reassure everybody that things will be different, that there will no longer be no Hero Commission, and that there will be a new system set in place. Something new, a coming of a new era. And so, Deku and Hawks, as well as Lady Nagant, would be freed from Tartarus and be known as free people, with them finally being able to have their own identities. As soon as this would happen, Hawks would be happy, as Deku would go to visit his family. And with visiting his family, would come an insanely heartfelt reunion with all of them smiling and just finally getting to explain everything that happened to Inko with Inko shedding tears and just being completely shocked at everything that her baby had gone through but now look at him he's now a man and now he can fend for his own 
she knows that Deku probably isn't just going to come back and act as if everything's okay, but she's glad that she at least has her son back in her life. So is Hiyashi and his younger sister, Hikari. Following this, Deku would enroll back into the UA high school, where he would actually end up being given his pro hero license way earlier than everybody else, becoming the youngest hero that has ever been in Japan, and actually establishing a really good connection with Kaminari and all the friends that he would have made along the way, with him actually rekindling his friendship with Bakugo once he finds out how awesome the actions that Deku did were, and also establishing a relationship with Momo Yayorozu. Things would be looking up for the young spy known as Agent 9, with that alias finally being gone and Deku finally having recovered his liberty, finally being his own man, having his freedom back. It is an amazing feeling. However, the job's not finished, and Deku can't simply smile knowing that one loose end is still out there. Yes, the League of Villains is out. Yes, Overhaul is taken care of. Yes, the Hero Commission is taking it out as well. However, there is still one loose end, the Liberation Army. And so, Deku would call a, a meeting with all of the greatest heroes in the world, with Deku actually explaining to them who the Liberation Army is and why they need to be taken care of as soon as possible. A sting operation would be planned with him saying that he understands that heroes will die. But this is something that needs to be taken care of. The Liberation Army is dangerous and Reed Destro must be stopped at any means necessary. His quirk and his influence over the Liberation Army is growing day by day. And if they don't put a stop to this man now, they might never be able to. He is unlike anything they've ever seen and Deku should know this because he infiltrated them. Known with the alias of Izuku Midoriya. A name that had long since been deceased and so wiped from the records. And so, Deku was now able to finally, finally convince the heroes of launching a full-scale attack on the Liberation Army. With the heroes saying, what are we waiting for? And Deku, as well as all of the heroes, being ready to plot their final battle. <laughs> However, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it for what if Deku was a spy. The reason that I'm leaving it off here is because I want you guys to be able to have the choice to decide, do the heroes win? Does the Liberation Army win? Obviously, it's kind of a clear choice just due to the fact that the League of Villains were able to defeat them, and that's five people comparatively to this huge army of heroes that was about to bust in and it was just about to create this insane battle royale. It was just, I think, a perfect place to end off. However, if you guys, like, if you guys really wanted to continue, you guys really want me to explain this and how I would actually have it all go down, then I, I'm, I'll be happy to do, like, a five-minute, like, bonus part. But that's only if this video gets, like, a ton of likes or the full series version gets a ton of likes. So if you want that, like the video here as well as like the video on the full series when it inevitably drops. That said, I love each and every single one of you guys. It has been your boy, Zether, and I am out. Peace.